Good morning, guys. Welcome back to Revolution. We're going to have a look at this video. Um, now, I watched this about a week and a half ago, which is an interview with Bart Ehrman with Jennifer Knust. And so we've looked at Jennifer Knust in a few videos um, previously. And so this is entitled How to Translate the Bible Problems and Pitfalls. Now, when I went through this, um, it just it made me cringe. Um, it it just shows you the ignorance or the willing ignorance of people like um, Mark Ward. And Mark Ward, he has um, a little bit of a bee in his bonnet about the issue of um, homosexuality being um, removed from some of the verses of this Bible. But it's like, oh, it's still a good Bible, you know, <laughs> because um, uh, I was going to you know, do a, uh, a video on Mark Ward again, but I thought, well, I might just um, start doing Bud Ehrman material. I've often wanted to expose Bud Ehrman's material. Bud Ehrman really isn't, he really doesn't know that much about the Texas receptor side of things. Now, um, Bud Ehrman certainly knows a lot about the critical text. He knows a lot about uh, modern Bible translations. He knows about, he knows personally many translators and scholars in the academy. But when it comes to the TR, usually he's actually worse than um, you know, even you know, people who you know, come up against us, like uh, you know, Elijah Hickson, Peter Gurry, uh, Timothy Berg, um, even James White. Like um, Bart Ehrman has the argumentation that's, that's so old and so outdated and so disproven, but because he's in the... Um, in the ivory tower and he's in the highbrow uh crew he doesn't seem to um want to be corrected on these things he just assumes that the what he got taught um in his uh university is correct what he's been teaching for years is correct and um and so oftentimes when he talks about the King James Bible or he talks about the Texas Receptus, history of the Greek, of the Reformation, you just left there cringing and going, where's this coming from? Because a lot of it's really outdated. And even in the last 10 years, a lot of things have been, a lot of things were already cleared up, but they just weren't popular. And so a lot of things have become popular due to the internet and people just constantly saying, look, we've been saying this for 50 years, you know, get with the program. So it, it makes people like James White look really bad in a debate, you know, when they're still parroting rubbish or, or anecdotes about Erasmus that have been disproven. And, but Bart Ehrman just sort of has all of them up his sleeve. And half the time, his mentor, Bruce Metzger, made some of these things up. <laughs> and so... Uh, obviously, he's going to run with you know, Bruce Metzger because he's the guru. Now, who is Jennifer Knust? Now, Jennifer Knust is, um, I've got a bit of a bio here. I might just run through that rather than going off the top of my head. So Jennifer Knust, uh, she is with the Duke University. Um, she's a scholar of religion who specializes in early Christian history and religions in the ancient Mediterranean. She's the author of Cast to Cast the First Stone. Now, isn't um, To Cast the First Stone a go-to book by um, most people who are on the critical text side? They'll say you really need to know this book. It's co-written by Tommy Wasserman. So we all know Tommy Wasserman. He doesn't live, believe in a literal hell. Now, I found that out on the Bart Ehrman blog. Um, I was reading through some things. And here Tommy Wasserman was saying to Bart Ehrman, I don't believe there's fire in hell. And it's like... <laughs> Okay. Um, in other words, hey, I'm like a Jehovah's Witness sort of thing. Um, so she wrote that with Tommy Wasserman in, in um, 2018. And so um, Jennifer Knoss also... Now, now, just try and try and get the theme of, of the things that she's been studying or been promoting or trying to teach to people. Unprotected texts. What does that sound like? Unprotected something else. The Bible's surprising contradictions about sex and desire. So that was 2011. And abandoned to lust, sexual slander, and ancient Christianity, 2005. She studies early texts and their contexts and their receptions from multiple angles with a particular focus on rhetoric and gendered discourse. 
Her numerous articles, books, chapters, and edited books address the materiality of texts, the intersection of Christian practices with other ancient religions and ethics of interpretation in ancient as well as contemporary contexts. And so um, most of her career is involved with sex and the Bible. So anything to do, you know, obviously a woman caught in adultery, that's where she's at. <laughs> um, you know, unprotected texts, you know, uh, you know, sex and desire in the Bible and all this sort of stuff. So, I mean, these are topics that are in the Bible. That's probably fine to study things out. Um, I just want to, actually, I've just got to turn this off for a sec. Um, I just want to show you a little clip. Now, I'm, I didn't plan on doing this. I haven't really planned on doing much about this, but this has just been on my heart to do for about a week and a half. <clears throat> because there's really, there's no need to write out a big narrative of this. We'll just watch through the video and you will be just as shocked as I am at that these people are considered um, <laughs> scholars, that these people are considered um, fit to do Bible translation. And so I'm going to just sit down in my YouTube videos and I'm going to find the video on Jennifer Knust. And so I'll just quickly zip down. Now, obviously, we've got Bart Ehrman in the house. And so um, I might just check as well. I might search for this actually so many videos now and what YouTube have done they put some into the live and some into videos so you're sort of like you get confused of where whether you did a live one or, or not um, so there's Jennifer Most. okay so I'll put that one right there so what I'll do I'll crack that one open now, uh, StreamYard has changed their um, format, which is quite weird. So if you, you can sort of see this whole screen here, um, but usually you can see the URL of YouTube and, and other things as well, but it, it seems to have changed this, uh, this format, and it's got like a blue box around it, which I'm not really familiar with. So... I'm hoping that I can still just like I'm dragging this screen around, but you can't actually see it now, which is quite annoying because usually I throw things up um, and, you know, look at different things or throw things over the top of this. So um, StreamYard have sort of changed. <laughs> and so, um, so just bear with me because they don't warn you that this cha this has changed. You just go to do it and it's like, oh, okay, well, um, you know, this is going to be fun trying to do a whole video where you want to show other videos or you want to show other things. Um, so I guess I'll have to share. Whoops, I've stopped sharing. Let me try that again. Present, share screen. Um, okay. Oh, it's given me different options. Window. Or entire screen that's better now I didn't share the audio with that so I'll have to get rid of that sorry about this guys present share screen entire screen screen two ah that's better ah oh, that's cool it just gave me some different options which I guess is pretty cool um, that you have all them but I didn't want that. See, now I've got the, the URL at the top there and I can go over it with the mouse because sometimes I like to pick their nose <laughs> with the thing or just circle their eyes as they're talking or whatever. But um, So I want to drag this video around. Where are we? Dun, dun, dun. Now I've lost the other video. Where did it go? Okay, we don't need that open. bit of cleaning up here and so I've been going through the issues with um, Turin and Fan and Unicorn so some of you guys have been sort of following this 
and yeah that's the video some of you guys have been following uh the Trudem fan uh issue now to me it's it's been quite amazing um the pushback that Trudem fan um has with or has has done with this uh word unicorn and so obviously um we believe the word unicorn means something like a, a, a rhinoceros like indian rhinoceros whether it's an extinct type of rhinoceros, whether there were larger ones or you know, ones with bigger horns or whatever, we're, we're not really sure, but we know it, it is a type of rhinoceros. And we know that um, this is following the Septuagint, is following the Latin Vulgate, it's following all the previous English Bibles that have unicorn. And so all of a sudden you come on the scene um, in 1611 with 60 of the, you know, the some of the greatest scholars in the world and they all went oh it's talking about a mythical creature <laughs> and you just left there shaking your head going and they even put in the marginal note in for a unicorn you know making sure that you know it's not a narwhal it's it's not a beetle it's not a a snake with a little bit of a nose or you know all these other unicorns that are out there there's a whole you know there's probably like 10 of them it's none of them it's specifically a rhinoceros because that's that was labeled under yeah, it's an umbrella term the word unicorn for all animals with one horn even mythical things had what that have one horn or just a drawing a cartoon that's called a unicorn as well it's none of them it's a it's a rhinoceros but then it's like oh we're going through the marginal notes they're alternative readings you won't find that word alternative readings in the the margin uh sorry in the um in the translators to the reader what you'll find is differences of senses diversity of senses so that can mean, yes, you know, sometimes it's rejoicing, sometimes it's um, exceedingly glad. Some, you know, diff, it's the same type of thing, but there's certain places where these words, um, sometimes there's, there's a certain type of nuance that you need to have with a certain word to get your point across or to relate it to a certain other thing. So they put all rhinoceros, which is rhinoceros, in the margin clearly showing which type of unicorn it was <laughs> and it's and it's like okay so let's look at the major english dictionaries the oxford one of the obsolete terms is or a rhinoceros for a, a synonym for unicorn you know it's like or it's a rhinoceros you know um the main term says that sometimes rhinoceros has been confused with a unicorn or called uh, a runner a unicorn has been called a rhinoceros and then you look at the biblical terms it's like well this is akin to a ream to a monoceros um to a, a unicornus in latin and rhinocerotis in latin it's almost like everything but then he's sort of going through you know what shakespeare had and all this and it's like look i, I understand people did um yeah there, there was the one horned horse thing going around it was on coins it was on the back of um shields it was you know on top of doorways it was it but so were cherub cherubims so were all sorts of different setters and you know goats with you know um uh, it, the bottom part was a goat's body and the top half is like a monkey looking thing um, that, there was all sorts of different things. It doesn't mean that the King James translators literally believed in all these things. Um, but this is where Turin and Fan is going. And I think he is, uh, uh, like, I've seen people sort of wave over things and just ignore things. Um, and I was I was pretty hard with him. I was saying, you're not reading the Oxford English Dictionary properly. So he just went through it and said, it's actually favouring me. <laughs> it's like ah uh, like it was just a headache in the end i was just like look and i i said to him yesterday he did another video he's he's done about like seven or eight videos on unicorns some of them going really long and i've done a whole heap sort of saying what i need to say about it but at the end of the day um i said look i'll debate you on it that i think that will close the issue because what you're doing then is you're putting everything um you you're putting your best argumentation out in front of everyone and the whole issue is like i was listening to a foreign language um course the other day and so they were just going through some of the basics in english and 
they were talking about um, you know, different nouns and collective nouns and all sorts of things. And so sometimes you can spark ideas just by listening to some of the basics of English. Because the Bible is a very basic type of um, book. And when you understand the basics of grammar, sometimes these things um, click in your mind, like understanding that you know the one which was and is and shall be is a is a noun phrase. Like that really helped me to explain in simple terms uh, to people what it was. And so understanding that you can get an, a type of animal like a dog and you can say the tail of a dog comes in all sorts of um, different sizes or the tail of a dog can wag when its owner comes in or you can you can make it plural or you can make it singular but it's the, the word dog can be plural or singular depending on the context and so it's one of the most basic concepts of english and to not understand that there are some contexts where it has the horns of the unicorns and sometimes the king james translators have put things in a plural sense to make it known like it might be singular underneath just like with Hashemayim, sometimes heaven is singular, sometimes it's plural, the heavens and the earth, the heaven and the earth. Um, you know, Genesis 1 1. Many people go over that. It's one of the favorite, oh, we got you. You know, the um there's a mistake in the King James. The New King James has heavens and earth. It, that's what it says. The I am means plural. So and you just like, yeah, the, the other heavens weren't around yet. You know, <laughs> you look later on and it starts using the same words. And in the next chapter, the exact same, Hashemayim is translated, you know, heavens and earth are plural because the other heavens are there, you know. So it's the contextual definition. And this, this is what I constantly stress is people need to understand the context of the Bible. And so not reading the context of these verses, just looking at the lexicon says it's singular, that's it. You know, um, they have this one having horns, but it's a singular animal. So I must be a bull. And this is this is so strange. Um, like to me, going through like some English um, teaching classes that someone you know, who's been like in Australia, like uh, English um, classes are given free by the government to people who, you know, come in from Syria, Saudi Arabia, Africa, um, you know, Vietnam, wherever people are coming from. And this is the type of thing that they would learn. Um, and to just see scholars overlook this and not touch it, it's, it's, it's quite irritating. Like sometimes I get really frustrated with how to explain things because it's like someone just saying one plus one equals three and you're just there going yeah but um or if someone's saying the earth's flat you're just like uh and you f you f almost feel like an idiot trying to explain it yeah, they're like see i've got you there and you're just there going um but anyway i just sort of throw that bit in about the unicorns because i'm sort of a bit over that whole issue but i've been um updating my website constantly and going through um, heaps and heaps of information. I might even just show you what I've been doing. So unicorn, I didn't want this to become a unicorn thing. But seeing as it's a hot button topic at the moment and uh, Answers in Genesis just recently did a video. So I've got my favorite picture of the unicornus. Um, your, yeah, unicornus. Sorry, I'm saying unicornus and I'm reading rhinoceros. That's how many, that's how, um, how much these synonyms have blended together for me. Um, so here we have the King James and rhinoceros. Here we have the Douay Reims that have rhinoceros in the main text, but have unicornus in the margin. Um, but one of the things that I just wanted to quickly show you, this is a 10th century picture of a, um, a rhinoceros. In Persia, they're saying, oh, it couldn't have been in the Middle East or, like, you know, Persia's pretty much Middle East. This is a rhinoceros. Um, this is a drawing from the uh, first century. Um, it's actually a mosaic. So this is a rhinoceros on a hill there. 16th century. Um, this has been drawn. 
And so my wife said that this is uh, Arabic writing. She can read Arabic and Urdu. They look the same from a distance. And this is the one I wanted to show you. Theodore Beza <laughs> in 1508. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see that there, but that's as close as I, I can get. Maybe I can enlarge and here we go, a tiny bit. See, that creature there is a rhinoceros. That creature there is a mythical unicorn. But they're both called... Look, it, it's easy to explain now. They're both in the same room, okay? They're both called unicorns because they both have one horn. Um, obviously, one's mythical and one is real. And so, um, yeah, so that's really quite, a, quite an amazing picture there. So I just thought I'd point that out. <laughs> Theodore Beza has the rhino on his um, 1608. Now, he passed away in 1605, I'm pretty sure. So what else do we have here that was of interest? Uh, yeah, a whole heap of Douay Ream stuff. Um, yeah, Daniel Webster's, he has an animal with one horn, the Monoceros. This name is often applied to the rhinoceros. Very basic, very basic information. Uh, and then we have, of course, the Oxford English Dictionary, which um, basically says here, the unicorn has at various times been identified or confused with the rhinoceros. There you go. I'm, I sound like I can't hope I'm doing that. Rhinoceros. Uh, used in uh, Middle English versions of the Old Testament to render the Vulgate unicornus or rhinoceros, the Greek monoc monoceros or monoceros, as translations of ring. And then it says later, in later versions, translated by Wild Ox in the Revised Bible by Westcott and Hort. But then we have uh, meaning number two here is a one horn rhinoceros obsolete. So you just go to basics like the Oxford English Dictionary and you're like, as I was saying, these are synonymous terms. So everything that I've said in the debate is true. Um, I, I just can't understand why, you know, where Turin fans are going with all this. Um, whether it's just, he's just simply not seeing the forest through the trees. It clearly says, yes, it says it's a mythical creature, a unicorn. With no one's in doubt about that. But then it clearly says here, um, the unicorn has at various times been identified or confused with the rhinoceros. So it's like throughout history, because um, certain things have one horn, that these things get identified with each other. And so, um, so I just thought I'd show that. But we're here to look at Bart Ehrman. So I just want to show you a clip of Jennifer Knust. Okay, now I've got to find it here. So this is an old video that I have up. Now I've just got to check the sound on this. My name is Tyler Sid. I am. Okay. My name is Tyler Sid. Now that's too loud. I might turn it down just a tiny bit. Okay, so we've got Docky in the house and A. Hannah. Hey guys. All right, let's get into this. Um, so. A bit of background. Who is Jennifer Knust? This should explain to you who she is. Okay, so listen very carefully to what's being said here. Okay, and just put yourself in this position. You've gone, imagine you've just walked in off the street. You want to go to this church. Okay, let's have a listen. I'm one of the leaders of the LGBTQ ministry of Marsh Chapel. On behalf of the chapel, I would like to welcome you to the second of four lectures in our lecture series this year, Outlook, Shedding Light on the LGBT Community and Culture. Last Tuesday, we were joined by Dr. Henderson of the Classical Studies Department in the lecture on homosexuality in ancient Greece. The dialogue continues tonight with a lecture on what the Bible does not say on homosexuality. I want to thank you in advance for being a gracious audience by silencing your cell phones 
and of course saving questions and comments for the Q&A, which will follow the lecture. Tonight, the LGBTQ ministry is honored to welcome Dr. Jennifer Knust to the podium. Dr. Knust is a specialist in the literature and history of ancient Christianity, with particular interest in the transmission and reception of sacred texts, and in the importance of gender discourses to the production of an early Christian identity. Dr. Knuse has been a member of the BU faculty since 2005. She has a PhD from Columbia University, has taught at the College of the Holy Cross, and has held fellowships from the Radcliffe Institute, the American Council of the Learned Society, and the National Endowment for Humanities. Her book, Abandoned to Lust, Sexual Slander, and Ancient Christianity, examines sexualized vocabulary of Christian authors and places it within a political context. She has also written several essays and journal articles about ancient views of sexuality, theories of sacrifice, and religious violence. She's currently working on a new book about sex and the Bible. She is also an ordained minister in the American Baptist Church USA. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Knust. Now this is, um, if this is a little bit too loud or too soft, just let me know. Because I often don't watch YouTube videos, I listen to them. And sometimes um, when I re-listen back on my videos, they can be really loud or really soft, but just let us know, um, that will help. Thank you very much. I really wanna um, extend a special thank you to the LGBTQ Ministries group for inviting me here, um, especially to um, Angelo, where are you, somewhere in here? And uh, there you are, and um, uh, Liz Douglas, somewhere. Hi, Liz, and uh, Tyler, whom we just heard um, heard from, and Kim also from BU today, who wrote the article for today, which has me rather nervous, and my mother very pleased, but I'm so thank you for that. Um, um, and also to Dean Hill for um, his continuing support of this group and his fine work at the Marsh Chapel. Um, I should say that when I'm trying to address a topic about what the Bible does not say about homosexuality is actually a huge topic. Um, I could never possibly cover this topic in an hour, so forget it. You know, it's not. Uh, because to my mind, the question of what the Bible does or does not say about homosexuality or sexuality at all is a complex question that we should be asking not only about same-sex pairing, but opposite or cross-sex pairings, and how um, those are presented in biblical books as well. So I couldn't possibly cover that. Um, as Tyler mentioned, I am writing a book right now um, that's trying to cover that, and I've written, I think, about 80 pages at this point, and that's probably not even a third of what the book is going to be. So um, I don't think you want to hear me read to you 80 pages of what I've written so far, so we're not going to do that. What you're getting tonight is a snapshot um, of what the Bible does not say about homosexuality <laughs> as opposed to a full-blown discussion. Um, so with that in mind, I'm... I'm not going to try to cover everything, but there will, I hope, I have my watch here, I'm going to try to keep an eye on it, so there will be time for questions and answers um, at the end of, of the discussion, and you should feel free to ask anything that you want. Because we do have a short time, I want to tell you what my argument is going to be. Um, I just want to foreground my argument right away so that you know where I'm coming from. Okay, so you, it's right on your handout, so I'm just going to read my three points, okay? Point one. What people today might mean when they hear or say the word homosexuality has very little to do with how those who wrote biblical books understood same-sex pairings. Arguably, then, the Bible says nothing at all about homosexuality. Okay, that's point one. You gotta, now I'm going to have a bunch of proofs at that point, so we've got to skip ahead to points two and three, which I'm going to cover together. Point two. <laughs> The few statements made in biblical books about same-sex relationships are contradictory and can be interpreted in many ways. There are simply no straightforward sayings either condemning or promoting same-sex love in the Bible. Point three. Statements about same-sex relationships must be placed within a larger complex of sayings about sexuality in general. When they are, it becomes clear that the Bible does not speak with one voice regarding opposite-sex relationships either which will get me at the very end to the conclusion, which I'm going to tell you in advance. Okay, I'm where? And this long, long hand up. The Bible is not a straightforward source of sexual morals, and treating it as such is a mistake. The Bible cannot arbitrate our concerns about sexuality, though biblical books may invite interesting and even helpful reflections on what it is meant to be human and sexual. Sexual desire is something that biblical authors were concerned about, just as we are concerned about this topic today. So that's where I hope to 
to con I hope to convince you that my conclusion is correct. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I can do it in an hour, but I'm going to try. Since you heard from um, Professor Henderson already on Tuesday night. <sighs> okay, so I think you get the gist. <laughs> so her three points were, um, you know, homosexuality is not even really mentioned in the Bible. Um, you know, same-sex love is very different to same-sex um, um, relationships. Or, you know, she had a whole bunch of stuff there. I'm, I'm absolutely butchering what she said. But um, you can tell that she is basically saying the Bible is not a book of morals. The Bible is just a, um, you know, there's many interpretations of the Bible. Um, many of these uh, scriptures that talk about, um, you know, same-sex marriage or you know, same-sex relationships, I should, should say, um, and homosexuality, sodomy, things like that, that they, they can be uh, reinterpreted some other way. And so there's a whole bunch of issues that she's got with, um, you know, having homosexuality mentioned in the Bible or forbidding people to practice in this. So she's saying the Bible says nothing whatsoever about this topic. So why are we bothering bothering with it? That's her first claim. She, she actually contradicts herself because it, then she goes through and sort of makes these other claims. So that's why it's a little bit confusing there. But uh, Jennifer Knust, uh, she argues that the Bible should be read and understand as a human product, okay? So rather than a divinely inspired text. So she doesn't believe that God inspired the Bible. I've, I've seen other videos of her where she is simply um, bad mouthing the uh, the Bible for its patriarchy, uh, for having you know God the Father, you know there it's it's like a blasphemy to her, um, and so um, so you know she comes against but the basic you know traditional Christian beliefs about the the Bible and inerrancy and just pretty much Christianity. <laughs> She's just simply an anti Christian. Uh, atheist, um, agnostic, whatever she would claim to be. Um, just like Bart Ehrman, he sort of wears both of those badges at the same time. Um, how these people are still in the Bible Academy shows you the deplorable state of the Academy. The thing that James White wants to defend and all these apologists are saying, oh, the NA28, but biblical scholars, Mark Ward will say, you know, these people are good people, you know, all the rest of it. Um, well, these are the types of people in the academy. And so we're going to go through a lot of these people um, over um, the next year. We're going to look at people like Tommy Watson. We're going to look at people and um, who are in the academy like uh, Bruce Metzger, um, Kurt Aylin, these people who are considered heroes uh, by you know, Mark Ward and by many others. And we're going to see what they really believed about the Bible. Um, so Jennifer Nost, uh, Knust is the proper way to say her name. So you say the K. Uh, she argues that the Bible contains multiple voices and perspectives rather than a single unified message, which some Christians... Um, see as diminishing the authority of the Bible. So it's a bit like Bart Ehrman's thing, the multiple Christianities thing. It, because it's usually just a myth anyway, it's like, well, all these myths sort of came into one. And so um, she argues that the Bible is not a reliable source of the information about the historical Jesus uh, and that many traditional Christian views of Jesus are not supported by historical evidence, um, which some Christians um see as undermining the foundations of the faith which is true um and knus book unprotected texts uh which is about the bible and sexuality has been a source of controversy among some christians as it challenges the traditional views of the um bible's teachings on sexuality and gender role so we're looking at um, not only just issues on the LBGT community that she was you know, speaking in the church and they were specifically talking about that or homosexuality. She talks about just gender roles, you know, um, traditional, you know, men doing men things, women doing women things. Um, and so that's just a few of the criticisms about Jennifer 
uh, Knust. So what would you do with someone like Jennifer Knust? Well, you would put her as the principal editor of the new revised standard version, wouldn't you? <laughs> That's what's happened. And so this is it's quite incredible, really, when you when you get into this type of thing, um, how how low the academy's gone. And <laughs> like, like just I mean, I've known for years, you, you start scratching the surface, even with the New King James. You've got people who are you know, involved with all sorts of sketchy things, well cancelled churches. You've got people who were, um, who would be known as just absolute liberals, you know, when, when it came to a critical time in their church denomination to vote for a, a certain thing. Um, to just remain like a normal church. No, they voted against it. They they spearheaded a campaign against that because they're, they're just liberals. And um, and that's the New King James, yeah, let alone these other things, these other, you know, 50-head Bible version monsters that are coming out of the, the lake of fire and just, just um, spewing venom at us. This is just another one of those horrible Bibles that are coming down the pike. And so I just want to have a look at what Bart Ehrman's got to say. So it's quite enlightening what um, Kudus says and what Ehrman says, because Ehrman was involved with the New Revised Standard Version. I think that was in 1987. And so, am I, yeah, the New Revised NRSV. There's so many acronyms. So it's not the NASB, it's the NRSV, <laughs> which is quite weird. But, um, and that was, that's probably one of the worst ones that I've, found when i'm going through um doing things i'm looking at the niv looking at the esv then i get to that one and i'm like Ugh. it's it's like that it's it's sort of sort of like the worst that the academy could really produce and so anyway let's let these guys start welcome to misquoting jesus with bart ehrman the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. <laughs> I just, I like, um, A. Hannah says, she sounds awesome and biblically sound. I'm pumped. Um... Tidor Magdan says, why is a woman preaching uh, 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 12? Um, so everyone's saying hello to each other. So I want to go through quite a lot of these Bart Ehrman videos uh, in the future. What I want to do is I want to keep up to date with what he's bringing out. He brings out quite a lot of material. I'm sure he's probably got a team of people writing for him. Um, but we want to keep on top of what he's doing but we also want to go back in time and look at some of the classic things like he does a whole lecture on the king james bible and so um and some of the debates it'll be great to look at them so uh so yeah rescue says is she in the academy um uh, i guess it depends what you label as the academy she co-wrote a book with tommy wasserman that uh james white uh recommends on the pericope adulteri he says it's the go-to book for that uh, Tommy Wasserman, he doesn't believe in hell. Uh, she co-wrote the book with him. Um, when I debated Stephen Boyce, he asked me about it, and I said, well, I think it's just um, a popular book. I, I don't think it's really that academic because it's not written by Christians, obviously. These people are just um, heretics. Um, and so is she in the academy? Well, she is the chief principal of the New Revised. I might get the exact title. So what's N... RSV update. Um, oh, Logos Bible Software is selling it. So it's a, I'm sure Mark Ward will want you to get it, even though he doesn't like some of it. Um, okay. This is the new one, the updated edition. National Council of Churches. There's so many editions, you don't know whether it's... This is the update update, or, or yeah, December uh, 2021. So it's been out for, I guess, a year. And does it say must? 
update, updated Bible. I might have to look specifically for that term. Okay, so it was 1989 that one came out. So this one has come out. The UE, okay. So a whole bunch of stuff um, about what they did. I don't know if it's naming or well, about the publisher. So that's the acronym there. It's got a UE on the end of it. Pop that in and okay. So um, not surprisingly, James Snap Jr. Uh, has <laughs> he doesn't like it. Let's put a um, big cross on that. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of issues he has with it. So let's type in just, okay. Um, I do not know how this outrageous error happened, but I suspect, I suspect the involvement of Jennifer Norst in making the NRSV UE had something to do with it. Um, yeah, this is the video that I just showed. The Bible says nothing about homosexuality. Um, and there's simply no straightforward sayings, either condemning or promoting same-sex love in the Bible. Um, so she is the... Uh, Dr. Knust is listed on the Friendship Press website as the general editor. So that's what I was looking for, the, the exact job description. So the general editor. Uh, that's pretty big. Uh, if you the, you are the general editor, usually you're, you're very important. So, okay, so they're going through the Old Testament people. Um, they've got the Apocrypha, of course, the New Testament. So they've got Michael Holmes, you know, he does all those long-winded books about, you know, the Bible text or is Jesus real or, you know, and you start listening to it and it's like, oh, this is just the most boring thing. It's just, it's the driest thing. There's not one ounce of spirituality in it. Um, okay, so where's Norst here? Oh. Okay, so we've got general editor. Okay, so what would general editor actually be? Okay. Okay. Book editor. Okay, so New Testament. So general editor is Michael W. Holmes. And then you've got the general editor, um, Nust, down here. So it seems like there's two general editors. So anyway, there's lots of people involved, but she plays a prominent role. And so I'll just sort of point this out here. Okay, so Jennifer Norst. I'll just see if he has anything else on this. Wikipedia. No, we're just sort of rabbit trailing down there. So let's get back to the actual video. says, this is a special episode where Bart Ehrman interviews a scholar. Megan Lewis will be back next week. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, edition of the Misquoting Jesus podcast. Today, I will be uh, interviewing Jennifer Knust, who is an expert on Bible translation, uh, along with many other things. <laughs> uh, this topic is a very interesting topic uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's, it's an issue that most people don't even think about much, even though they, uh, they benefit from it. How do you take the Bible from some other language, translated originally in Greek and Hebrew, and how do you put it into English or into any other uh, modern language? Um, there are over 2 billion Christians in the world, and most of them have some kind of access to the Bible. Two billion Christians in the world. <laughs> I mean, just this vague, you know, vague generalization. All the Catholics are Christians as well. And that's because, you know, these people who are in the ecumenical movement, 
um, you know, with Bruce Metzger, with Carlo Martini and others, you're hanging around, you know, Catholics and Mormons, a Mormon guy worked on the Old Testament, um, you know, they're Christians. They're just, you know, if you type in how many Christians are in the world, it'll come out with 2 million, you know, just no real distinction. And because Bart Ehrman believes in many different types of Christianities in the ancient world, it's just this vague sort of, they're all Christians, you know, 2 billion of them. Um, I would, I would bring that number right down lower, lower, lower. Um, people who are most, I would say 95% of church going people who I've met are simply not Christian. They, they are either absolutely heretical or they are false prophets, false teachers, false Christians, false converts, people who think they're Christians and they're, they're not. You just, you know, with some people, it's like they're like a little bit of a pimple, a bit of a bit of a poke and a bit of a pinch. And what's on the inside, the real fruit of what's on the inside starts coming out. And so you start talking about the Bible to them and, and they get instantly bored. They start yawning. Uh, they're like they start talking about golf and, and they have zero interest in God. What usually when you meet another Christian, you start talking about Christianity. They're, they're, they're into it, you know. Um I'm not saying you have to be you're absolutely fanatical, but yeah, you actually want to engage a, a little bit. <laughs> you know, you don't you don't have to be full on like, yeah, let's go out straight preaching right now. It's a, a, usually when I meet people like that, it's like, yeah, well, this person's obviously on fire for God. But there are other people who aren't that extroverted about their Christianity. But some people are deeply ashamed. They're, they're just like, oh, don't bring it up here. Don't, I, I don't want my boss to find out, you know. But, um, yeah. Bible in their their language. But how, how does it happen exactly? And it involves problems with translation just generally. I mean, anybody who translates a book, whether it's Dostoevsky or the Apostle Paul, uh, has problems. Uh, I mean, I had two copies of Dostoevsky on my, um, on my uh, shelves here. And it was interesting going through, like looking at the way it had been translated from the Russian into English, because I thought they would be identical. I opened one, I was like, okay, that's interesting. I opened the other one, I was like, wow, this reads so much better. It was just, a, a, I think the one of them was a little bit older. But um, it, they don't have to be so different. It just depends. And sometimes it can just be one person doing it. Sometimes it can be someone who doesn't really know English that well, translating something. They're, they're stronger in Russian than they are in English. See, that's the benefit of the King James is they knew English. They knew the, the um, target language of English just as well as they knew the Latin, just as well as they knew the Greek, just as well as they knew the Hebrew, just as well as they knew many of the other languages. And so they were able to bring things across and carry them across um, in a perfect way, but also because of the superior translation technique that they used, they were able to um, cross-reference one another and run their type of translating through the filter of, of other scholars. And so it would come out, um, I guess it's like having, you know, uh, yeah, we, we, we marvel at having like AI bots. We can ask them questions and they'll, they'll just spit out something that's quite amazing. But imagine, you know, scholars, these scholars knew uh, they could speak to each other in Latin, in Hebrew, in Greek. Uh, many times they did this type of thing. They would lecture just fully in Greek, and um, they would they would um, teach just reading Homer, and everyone would in the class was expected to understand it and take notes on it and talk about it the, in back in Greek and these type of things. And so, when you know a language that fluently, you can bring things across properly. Now there is that video that's going around. Now I might actually quickly bring this up because I'm laying a foundation here because. Um, I'm starting Bart Ehrman series and um, uh, looking at different things of Bart Ehrman. And so uh, I want to get some feedback also on, on what you think of Bart Ehrman. So I'm just going to quickly look at, it will be my subscriptions. 
<clears throat> okay, so my subscriptions. The strange thing is, I I usually use my phone for everything when I look at stuff, and it, YouTube works way better on a phone. A lot of even Facebook, everything works way better on a phone. It's it's quite amazing. Um, you jump on. I used to jump on the jump on the computer to sort of to get away from the phone because I was so restricted on the phone. Now I find I'm jumping off the computer and jumping onto my phone because it's it's quicker. It's more accurate. It, if you uh, click on a link on Facebook, it will go straight there. We're on a on your computer. It, it'll just show you where the thread is, and you have to go through and read it all. It's like um, okay, so here we are. Now I've just got to find this bar in the video. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. We're nearly there. I did take books in. wasn't live apostate churches four months ago oh yeah here we go surprised by a biblical scholar His remarks there were quite telling. Again, this is this is a man that's at the top of his field, well known, well respected, and yet his remarks on the King James Version Bible really struck me. So let's take a listen. There are questions among scholars about how many people actually participated in the translation, but the best guess is that there were 47 uh, translators who were all skilled, highly skilled, in uh, in Greek and Hebrew. Today, when somebody's highly skilled in Greek, uh, like Jeff Seiker and me, we're, we're considered highly skilled in Greek. That means we can kind of slosh our way through a Greek text if we have a good dictionary sitting next to us. <laughs> These guys, including King James, could speak Greek and did speak Greek to each other when they felt like it. Uh, and they could read Hebrew like the newspaper. So, I mean, this is, th these were serious, uh, serious scholars who, uh, you know, their excuses, they didn't have TV. Uh, there, there was no ESPN. Uh, they, uh, you know, what did they do? They sit around and study Greek. And this is what they did. And so they were at Latin and Hebrew and what they had. I thought this was very interesting. And so, yeah, it's, it's a good point made out in that video that um, <clears throat> Bart Ehrman's admitting that he's, you know, considered a Greek scholar. And he sloshes around with a dictionary. <laughs> and so he and he's at the top of his field. And so this is one of the things with Bart Ehrman. Um, even though he says a whole bunch of nonsense, what he does is he um, he reveals to the world how sloppy the academy really is. And how um, now I'm not saying this is with everyone. There are people who do scholarly work in the academy. Now obviously they have a critical text bias. But um, someone like Bart Ehrman, how, how these guys can get to the top, like how someone like James White can claim that he's a Greek scholar, Dan Wallace. Yeah, I know he's written books on the Greek language, but, I mean, seriously, um, if, if you know, someone, like people who I know personally um, could just walk up and just start speaking Greek to these guys, now, someone like, say, Georgios Babiniotis, who I've had correspondence with, he's probably one of the greatest living Greek linguists in the world. Now, he knows all of the Greek language, you know, from ancient Greek, Koine Greek, um, Byzantine-era Greek. He, he's, he's, he knows everything. He knows different types of dialects, Macedonian influence on Greek, and he, he knows... He's written 200 books on the Greek language. Six, he's done six dictionaries that are well, the, they're the main dictionaries that are used in Greece. And so um, he could go into a room with these guys and say, hey, Tikhanis, and they wouldn't know what they're like, oh, what's that mean? You know, I've, I've read about how Dan Wallace got lost one time in Athens and 
they were trying to work work out where to go and what to do and they they were talking to people and no one understood them and eventually they wrote some stuff down this is a bunch of scholars and eventually they were able to sort of decipher oh they're supposed to be in this hotel probably phonetically you know like use the greek alphabet you know and they, they scribbled it down and this was in his credo course he was talking about this and i was just like this guy doesn't know the language that now, now I understand that there can be, you know, dead languages and people, you know, they can they can study uh, these types of languages and you don't speak them daily to your family or whatever. They're, they're just, they're languages that are dead. And so you can, um, you can understand those languages. There's actually a specific term for it, but I've forgotten it. But um, Greek's not one of them. Greek, the, the syntax and morphology of Greek has been quite stable for about 2,000 years. And so if you were to listen to someone speaking Koine Greek, it'd be like a bit like us listening to someone speaking in King James English. We would understand it. There might be a few things that sort of throw us a little bit or a bit of grammar that's like, oh, I wouldn't say it that way. Or or it's like, what's that word mean? It's obsolete. But see, the thing is, a lot of the Greek words have been carried through and some of them might have morphed and changed uh, meaning in a few different ways. And so and one of them, yeah, I've, I've spoken about this word before, but one of the words when you're having um you know so many greek friends and um, working with greeks over over my life um one of them is a swear word which um, if i say it now greeks will shudder um but it's quite a common word and it just means soft so when it says you know what did you go out to see did you see um you know kings are clothed in soft soft clothing so that word soft is uh malaka and so um that usually is equivalent to one of the harshest swear words that we know the c word <laughs> that's usually what it translated to when i would ask friends oh, what does that mean and they'd say what well, means this there was a whole bunch of other swear words usually when you're around unsaved people they just teach you swear words <laughs> that's the first thing they do and so that's you know what what i know this word to mean and so but uh, um, apparently in one um corinthians chapter six where it has asinokoite, where it means um, men uh, who sleep with uh, other men. Um, this word, um, malakoi, is actually uh, translated as effeminate. So it means you know, soft. And so um, many Bible translators have said that this uh, uh, effeminate isn't just someone acting, you know, in, in an effeminate fashion. Um, what this is, is someone who is um also um the on the receiving end of homosexuality and so it gets in quite into detail in in that now um i want to keep this as g-rated as possible but this is part of what they go into in this video so i just sort of thought i'd let you know that that's um that's what's happening so but the thing is um one of the main things that the uh, members of the academy always talk about is how it's almost impossible to translate anything over properly and i've used the example of the people i know from the uh, who were translators from the eu into luxembourgish they said they could translate everything when you talk to people who are translators who translate things for a living um, these people usually will say that yes you can translate everything and that's why you know when you buy um, a certain product you will you know it could be some sort of thing to do with your health it could be you know keeping your mother alive or you're testing her pulse if it's if it's wrong it'll give you the wrong reading and it, you could be rushing into hospital for no reason so you want it to be accurate so but you speak japanese and you bought it in canada but if you open up the pay the you know a five sheet of paper it's got it in arabic it's got it in all different languages exactly what to do how were they able to translate all of that properly, but not the Bible? How come all scholars would probably agree that having in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, is an accurate translation of NRK and Hologos, Kai Hologos, and Proston Theon, Kai Theos and Hologos. That's, um, that's an accurate way of translating the Greek. And I would agree with that. Probably Bart Ehrman would agree with that. James White would agree with that. Any one of you guys would agree with that. But at the end of the day, um, how come we can get one verse correct, but not the next one? 
and not that it, how many verses do we get to to where we're like well this verse is just too hard to translate well obviously if you're fluent in both of the languages and you're practicing translation work for a living like say um you're working in these languages like lancelot andrews knew 21 different languages um henry seville he was um teaching the queen elizabeth uh the queen of england um greek he was her tutor um when you go through um you know john boyce knew hebrew at a very young age uh, expert in greek um these guys knew their stuff and so these guys would be translating into latin they'd be translating into greek and to have um biblical texts in many different languages like you had theodore Beza, you had the greek you had the latin and then usually the vulgate to show where there was a difference um and then annotations explaining hebrew idioms and going through all sorts of things about the language many times people like stephanus um robert stephanus and henry stephanus these guys were printing grammars um but hebrew grammars um, greek grammars latin grammars and so this this was an era where um see one of the things people have to understand about um the english language is that in many other countries they had a renaissance of art or um poetry or or um they had renaissance of of fashion you know the, so say in italy it was obviously art you had the da vinci's and you had other people michelangelo and they're all doing their thing and it's like this renaissance was um you know, getting back to the to the beauty of art and 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 those sorts of things but with what happened with the reformation um now this happened in a lot of countries but specifically in england the renaissance was of words and they realized that you can have an art form in words you can be creative with the way that you write things um which is it's not unheard of in other cultures to have this but some cultures i mean english is it looked like a mongrel language because there were so many different influences and so um english has a lot of french loan words has a lot of german loan words and the thing is because the french um speaking um uh aristocracy ruled over uh, england for about 200 years the a lot of the words that we see as highbrow are actually french words that so we might say champagne and and uh, a chair and uh, these these words are a bit different to wine and stool they're, they're very different like wine and stool seem more earthy that's why anglo our anglo-saxon roots are, are in the germanic so when, that's why when we listen to hitler we're like we're like this is very serious this is because it, it resonates with our um our our earthly type of instinct our village instinct our your know, farming words simple terms like many times that they're all from german but when we're talking about something very fancy when we listen to someone in french it's like oh la la oh yeah and it's very pleasant and it's you know very nice and so um these two influences are huge on our language and so um we have a colorful language we also adopted lots of loan words from many other places around the world from from arabic from uh, many of the african countries and so we we use these um for our language and so what happened was when we came to the era of um the jacobean era or around the time of king james you you've got people like shakespeare and people from all different um language types recognize shakespeare as being you know one of the most colorful and vibrant you know people wordsmiths um in the world so this was an era of wordsmiths and so just as much as leonardo da vinci was surprising everyone with his talent michelangelo with his and you know Raphael and all the other ninja turtles these um these guys were amazing people with their prose which is just the, the this their skill their rhetoric their the way that they were putting words together and so that's why in english many times if you get a basic dictionary so i got this um about a month after i got saved or uh, actually it was about a week after i got saved 
thought it was a Webster's, but it's not the Webster's. It's a 1994 edition or something like that. And so 1993. But at the back of it, half of it is a dictionary and half of it is synonyms, okay? And so it's really good. So it would have like brand, um, denounce, stigmatize, mark, and it has noun, firebrand, torch, bolt, lightning flash, catch it, mark, stamp, tally, blot, repro reproach, stain, st so it's got a whole bunch of synonyms. And this is one of the things that we love when we're doing studies on the internet. We can just type in Google a synonym for a word and, and half the time we're like, wow, that says it's so much clearer. And so English has that ability to use a lot of synonyms. And we we can do that. Some languages don't have that. Some languages just have one word for one thing and it's sort of like that. Um, that's that explains it and they understand that. But we 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 just have this uh, a quite colourful language. That's why English can be quite a hard language uh, to learn. So anyway, I'm going to uh, move on. But I just sort of mentioned that Bart Ehrman is sort of of that school where nothing can ever really be translated properly. That's because, as I was mentioning before in that other video that I showed, he's not an expert. He's fumbling away with the Greek dictionary. Yes, they can talk about the def definition of Greek terms, but many times they're not fluent enough and sometimes not even fluent enough in English to bring things across. And this is one of the troubling things where sometimes you'll see uh, these guys don't have a firm grasp. They see mistakes in the King James Bible where someone even just learning the basics of English can go, that's not actually a mistake. Like, you know, the, some of the debates I've been through recently with unicorn, it's like, um, you know, the whole, whole thing of the pluralization of, of animals and things like that but even with um like cherubim and having cherubims well obviously it's a loan word from hebrew so the hebrew grammatical rules don't apply if we've stolen that word and it's english now the hebrew grammatical terms don't apply to that word anymore english does so if we call them cherubim and then we have plural cherubims and we put an english end on on the end of that word that's perfectly fine but um, trying to explain this in a debate, it's like trying to explain why one plus one equals two. It's like oftentimes it's just people's um, misunderstanding of the English language itself. But even things like the Granville Sharp rule that people go on about, oh, Granville Sharp, you know, he discovered this rule that, you know, if you, um, what is it? If you have um, a, a proper uh, name, but you have a definite article before the first one and you have a conjunction chi in the middle, but you don't have a, a definite article after the second one, then it's talking to the same person. And so when you read the King James, it's exactly what they have in uh, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1, and in also Titus 2.13. Theodore Beza knew of this rule. Calvin knew of this rule. The King James translators knew of this rule. They used it throughout their Bible, but because people don't read English properly, they assume that they didn't use the rule. And so this Granville Sharp guy comes on the scene and says, hey, they didn't use the rule. People believe him. They still parrot that nonsense. And it's just a, it's just a nothing. The, the, their whole argument against the King James Bible coming from the Granville Sharp rule is just absolute rubbish. But it just comes down to someone um, slowly reading through the King James English and going, oh, okay, so they use the word... Um, the K there, which is sometimes in Erasmarian Kai, which is usually and, that can also mean also. So if it has um, if the great God uh, and our Saviour Jesus Christ, um, or if it can have a great God also our Saviour Jesus Christ, um, no, even, sorry, it can mean also, but it can also be even. The great God, even our Saviour, Jesus Christ, it makes it a little bit clearer that you're talking about the same person. But in 1611, it was perfectly fine to have the K there. Um, they knew who was being talked about. They knew that it was the same person. It was the God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and God and our Saviour. And so, um, anyway, let's get back to this. Uh, just involved with taking words in one language and sentences in one language is putting it into another. There are special problems that come up with the Bible in particular for uh, a lot of uh, a lot of reasons that we'll be getting uh, into. And so uh, I'll be talking about all that. 
with uh, with Jennifer uh, Knust, who is a colleague of mine in uh, Crosstown uh, rival Duke <laughs> University, where she has been uh, a professor of religious studies since uh, 2019 and has been active in the field of, of uh, biblical research and, and teaching for uh, for a long time. She did her um, she did her Ph.D. at Columbia uh, University in New York uh, in uh, 2001, and she's written a number of books and a, a huge number of articles on all sorts of aspects of, of uh, especially New Testament and early Christian studies. And uh, recently, she has been a member of the uh, new Revised Standard Version updated edition, <laughs> this new translation, the, the newest translation that has just come out, uh, that is getting very, very positive reviews. Uh, we're not going to talk about the uh, uh, that particular translation unless it happens to come up. I'm I'm really more interested here in the general questions about uh, about translation and uh, and and the Bible. So uh, so uh, Jenny, welcome. Thank you, Bart. It's great to be here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So I just want to kind of start with the general thing. I mean, we you know when I would. When I was a kid, you know, there are like two translations I knew about. <laughs> there was the RSV and the King James Version. And now it seems like there are about 26,000. Uh, so uh, <laughs> why, why, why do people keep translating the Bible? And like, do, do we need all these translations? Oh, well, I can't speak for others. I mean, I know something about why the New Revised Standard Version decided to be updated or why um, okay. the SBL and the National Council of Churches decided. SBL and the National Council of Churches. Okay. So I'll just want to go through some of these comments because I don't want to leave anyone behind. So A. Hannah says, she makes some great points. You are, if you're unsaved, living in sin, don't believe in the Bible. And in some transgendered relationship, really good points. <laughs> um, yeah, Rescue says, the Bible says nothing about homosexuality, only if you take um, it all out. 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 9 to 10 in the NRSVUE is terrible. Um Shaiti says grace and peace uh, and says the English language is a big jumbo pot of ancient influences. Yes, very true. Uh, Alec Cox, uh, so everyone's saying hello to each other. English is such a broad language, it is very possible to tra um, translate accurately. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and even someone like um, Tyndale, when he was doing his translation, he said, it was actually way better than Greek and Latin. He said this English language is superior to both. And so um, there you go, <laughs> better than Latin. I did update that. I don't know the why SBL others do. Society, Society of Biblical, Biblical Literature, Literature yeah. sorry, and the National Council of Churches, the NCC. Um, I know why they did it. I know a little bit about why the uh, um the NIV, the New International Version Committee, did their translation. I know I've taught some Bible history classes, so I've done some historical investigation of why. But um, I don't know all of the answers to all of them. But people, you're absolutely right. People love to translate the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but why? I mean, like, are the, I mean, so uh, so I was you know, for money. There's so much money involved in these Bible translations that why wouldn't you do it? It's, it would be silly not to do it if you were looking at all these gullible Christians out there who don't, you know, they don't know anything. And it's, hey, we can just give them some slop and they'll pay top dollar for it as long as it's wrapped in, you know, leather binding and it's got a ribbon in, in the middle of the page. It's like they'll pay you know, $50 for that, walk around proudly with it. Um, why wouldn't you? <laughs> it's There's a market there for gullible Christians and for false believers and for cult members and Catholics and all sorts of weird, weird people. And so why would it be silly not to? So someone like Rupert Murdoch or someone involved in the print game um, has just gone, let's do this. Yeah, Thomas Nelson, deeply compromised. Yeah, they actually printed the American um, revised version. Uh, of 1901 and they what's interesting i actually did an article this would have been way back i think it was in the 90s i think it was like 1993 this article came out oh no it was talking about that era of time and it was about thomas nelson and they actually printed i think it was good morning holy spirit by benny hinn 
and there was a huge backlash with that because they were saying this guy's a deep compromiser but they sold out they they were like we don't really care anymore we're going to make lots of money from this and they did and they promoted him and he got really popular and people were saying well this group's compromised and that's the thing when, when you're saying all these um companies your know, logos bible software faith life lexum uh when you're talking about thomas nelson when you're talking about zondervan when you're talking about uh, the connections that they have with news corporation and big um, huge media juggernauts you, you're looking at deep compromise and even your sbl you're looking at the world council of churches i mean the world council of churches even billy graham like i think it was like in 1949 he was saying the world council of churches this year are probably going to nominate the antichrist you know that that's how, he said that they were evil but it was like 10 years later he was sort of part of it <laughs> He's just, yeah, he used to be an on fire preacher. And then obviously someone gave him a bunch of money and said, what are you doing, Billy? We'll make you famous if you just shut your mouth a bit and love the Pope and don't believe in hell and just think everyone's saved and just become a, um, you know, apostate and we'll, we'll fund you. It's like, okay, cool. And you'll travel all around the world for free. <laughs> um, so, yeah, anyway, let's continue. You know, so I, I was a I was a research rep for the original NRSV uh, committee for several years uh, toward the end of it. And um, at that point, I guess they were revising a revision that had been done in 1952. So it was about 30 years later. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess that kind of makes sense. So what what reasons do people have? I mean, why I mean, why do you need both a new international version and an NRSV and why? Well, I, you probably should speak about the NRSV. That is so cool that you were part of that original committee in, in a way, you know, because obviously Metzger was the lead of that and Metzger was your advisor, if I remember correctly. So um, you would, of course you were. Um, I think that uh, the new international version, as I understand it, was a reaction in part to the um, revised standard version and the decision among other issues around the, um, how to translate Parthenos um, or... I, I believe so. I mean, I believe so. Okay, yeah. You know, virgin, okay, okay. the word is virgin. And um, and so the thing is, these guys, are they love the soundbite type of thing. Your Parthenos, Parthenos shouldn't be really an issue um, in the, um, the Parthenos in the, the Alma in um, Isaiah is translated Parthenos by Matthew. So we, when you believe in the inspiration of scripture, you believe, yeah, sorry. Thanks for that. The video is a little bit too loud. I'll just turn it down a little bit. Thanks help. Um, so the Parthenos is uh, the Greek way of translating Alma and it's translated as virgin. It just means virgin. So what they did in 1952 is they actually translated that as a young woman instead of virgin. So that up opened up a whole can of worms because there was also Jewish influence in there where they, they have this whole theory that uh, Mary wasn't a virgin, that she was having sex with a Roman soldier called Pantera. And um, yeah, all this sort of stuff was creeping into the Bibles. And so that's Bruce Metzger was part of this. And so um, they love this sort of scandal, this this type of thing. And they're probably hired by these Bible companies to create these type of scandals so that people buy these and put them, like even just interested Christians. It's like, I've got to get this to see how bad it is. Or um, it, there's, there's just money. There's so much money to be made in these. But the thing is, um, Bart Ehrman at the beginning said they're getting great reviews. So that would be, you know, certain churches. <laughs> I don't even know which churches are you know, in America, you know, um certain big juggernaut churches where you know denominations where they just say okay we're going to get rid of the niv and we're just going to put this new one and so they go and buy you know sixty thousand of these and um and that just keeps the um bible industrial complex um money train flowing Ishati said i figured that out when teaching my kids spanish and learning greek oh yeah interesting very interesting. Uh, Thomas Nelson is now owned by News Corp. Yeah, so he bought the rights of the New King James quite a long time ago. Um, and so, and Zondervan. So Zondervan are basically um, run by News Corp. So Rupert Murdoch, he said he's retired, but um, 
he is he's a bit like a uh here in australia so he's like the mafia i remember remember my my dad said that he remembers uh the murdoch boys and the packer boys the kerry packer used to own a whole bunch of magazines here in australia and they used to punch on down the streets with baseball bats and you know trying to raid each other's offices and things like that and you know having copyright issues and it was quite full on it was like the mafia and so um yeah these these people are, are pretty wild and so rupert murdoch uh he's been known to like say in england he bought up a whole bunch of newspapers and then put page three girls on you know the girls with their boobs hanging out and everything uh in these respectable magazines uh, and or sorry uh newspapers and just turn them into tabloid trash um and he's done that in america you know obviously he's been involved uh, with shows like the simpsons and and other things for many years you know fox is basically rupert murdoch so um you can sort of look, look at the trail of rupert murdoch now i've got an interesting book um about him called the digital murdoch which is there somewhere but it's quite interesting that his great grand uh sorry his grandfather was a presbyterian minister which is quite interesting but anyway let's get back to this as you know in hebrew the word is alama and so um you know he shall send a virgin in the is the tradition and um the, the uh, hebrew counterpart in that RSV is translated as young woman, and that was considered um, terrible and a scandal. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Hold, on, hold on a second. Let's get into that. I was going to get into that later, but let's get into it now because it's going to get to you know why you need translation. So, but I mean, okay, so you're talking about a passage in the book of Isaiah. So in Isaiah yes, exactly. 7, that exactly. is uh, important, always important around uh, around Christmas time because uh, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And that's yes. how it's quote. Quoted and I, I in the King James version. I don't remember the exact question, but Isaiah seven fourteen says something uh, that a uh, let's see a, a a a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and uh, you shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh, something. Right. Like that. And the and the 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 Revised Standard Version in uh, nineteen fifty two translated yeah. Isaiah as a young woman. Uh, yes, shall conceive. And I, re my grandfather went nuts when that came out. Oh, really? <laughs> he, oh my God! Yeah, he was a Pentecostal Christian. He's like, oh my God, they have, they have taken the virgin birth out of the Bible. And uh -huh. uh, but that, but see, it's quoted, and people, many people on this will know, it's quoted in the New Testament as well. Yes, uh, and it's it's quoted with this word Parthenos, meaning virgin. Virgin, but, right? But so. Uh, right. And so people got kind of upset because now you either if you translate it as virgin in uh, in the Hebrew Bible, it's not an accurate translation. But if you don't translate it as virgin, then it sounds like uh, Matthew's not really quoting the Bible correctly. <laughs> right? Exactly. So get, exactly. Right? OK, so you said the. So notice she's saying exactly, exactly. So what he's saying is that Alma shouldn't be translated as virgin. So but the thing is, culturally, women in israel were virgins until they were married this was culturally this was how it is now i know today there are you know cultural groups you know even in um many islamic countries and things like that where they would say that those sort of things are happening and they're not um but we're, we're not talking about today we're talking about back in those days we're talking about people who lived very simple lives you know village type of lives and you know, they were um, a lot more morally pure than a lot of people living today who, you know, a lot of people are just saturated with pornography and, and violence and television, uh, well, video game violence and TV stuff. And just their mind is just absolutely saturated with this stuff. So to even consider that someone would remain a virgin until their marriage is just considered anathema to, to a lot of people. And so... Um, Jennifer Knuss is sort of like, yeah, you can't translate that as virgin. She's just agreeing with what Bart Ehrman says. She's saying, yes, exactly. Um, but you can. And the King James translators knew that you could. And so um, the um, so Ishati says, is this woman saved? And I think, thanks, Helg, for um, giving me a heads up about the video being a bit too loud. Is this woman saved? Absolutely not. This, this woman is... Um, she doesn't even really believe the Bible is true. She doesn't believe the Bible comes from God. 
that that's how bad it is it's it's not like she's not even pretending now in this interview she does sort of pretend to be like the i'm the bible translator and uh, but bart Ehrman knows who she is these people are basically both on the same page and so maybe um no I, I won't go down that rabbit trail i'll be here for 10 minutes and just to show you another clip but i'll find it for next time where there's this clip where um she's basically just saying all oh, the bible's outdated it's not really good for any society to follow the bible and why would you you know it's just full of it's just really supports men it's written written by men for men um it's not really a, a book that's favorable to women and all this stuff and you're just there going who's this lady and then when when they announce that she's going to be one of the um, principal editors for this bible translation i'm just like what <laughs> you know but this is how deplorable uh, i and i know people will just keep saying well is this is this woman a christian and you're like no and it's why would you have a christian a non-christian writing a bible why would you have her editing a bible why would you have her even in the same room why would you have why would you even respect her opinion at all but see this is part of the academy the academy they're like um like tommy wasserman he's like well it doesn't matter if you're a christian or not you you can do bible translation you can find out where the word of god is you can work on the na 29th edition it doesn't matter if you're christian or not and so that's why they still have bart in there they have people like this coming on board so you can just be a, a complete your atheist and you then next thing you know you, you're right up in that ranks of the bible society so that just shows you how um terrible the state of um christianity you know what is seen as christianity is because um you know someone would think i'll write to the bible society i'll get an answer i'll write to sbl and get an answer or the world council of churches and get an answer they'll probably send you to you know the the lbgtq community and give you a rebuke for even thinking that um you were you're in sin living a, a certain lifestyle it's like no you're fine you know um and so it says here so matthew can't trade and translate as virgin either well no they say that um this is this is part of what she's saying and bart ehrman's saying is that both of them all alma doesn't match parthenos as alma means a young woman but it also a young woman in israel was a virgin that they were synonymous and so um that's why it was translated as virgin by matthew because he's he grew up in that culture they they know these things and so um but you know wind it forward um two thousand years in a culture that's um you know saturated in post kinseyism if you don't know about um kinsey and um the child molestation that he did to um uh you know, create a massive mess in in the courts and also bring in a whole bunch of um new perspectives on sexuality uh that really hit in the 1950s and 60s um post kinsey the world has completely changed and um the courts the the yeah that's why a rapist will get two years uh, jail um where you know someone who murders someone that they might get in a lot of um a lot of trouble that's why you know child molesters and people like that usually get off it usually goes back to kinsey so there's an interesting book called kinsey crimes and consequences and so i recommend anyone uh look at that read that if there's any videos on that watch it uh he was funded by the united states government to molest children and so he would molest children he would um, also, yeah, um, SJT just says, Kinsey's the reason why we have porn. This, this He would go down to the nightclub districts and ask people, you know, have you ever felt like you wanted to, you know, sleep with a dog or sleep with a man or sleep with a woman or, you know, all this sort of stuff. And, and he came out with all these statistics that, you know, 90 percent of people believe this and they're all from the red light district not just not knocking on a you know on the door of normal america he was going to where this type of thing was happening and asking people and of course they're out that's why they're there <laughs> and so um and this created a lot of change in america um and it you know it's part of the you know part of the larger 
uh, thing from the ACLU and, you know, if you know about all that sort of stuff and the um, breaking down of morals in the United States, which unfortunately, you know, Australia, many other countries just follow the US. And so that's why when someone, you know, rapes someone, sexually abuses someone and they get off on bail and they never see jail time, I just go, Kinsey strikes again. You know, it's like, you know, this, it was 70 or 80 years ago now, I think, but Kinsey's uh, shadow is still upon us. Um, so, yeah, these people could not even conceive that she would be a virgin. They would think, oh, Mary slept around, of course, with 10 other people before you get married. That's what you do nowadays, isn't it? You know, that's what even good Christian girls do that now. And so that's their mindset, you know, how, and that, that's how the Bible was, you know, sort of saying a young girl, a young maiden shall be with, you know, it's not a virgin. And so the King James translators knew Matthew translated it as a virgin. The King James translators translated it as a virgin. I mean, if you've got someone who's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that his words are going to be correct and he puts virgin there, it's going to be virgin. <laughs> it's, it's, Parthenos means virgin, but they're saying Alma can mean either one, you know, oh, and it probably doesn't mean virgin. So they're saying it's a contradiction there that people have just tried to, the King James translators just went, oh, there's contradiction. Let's just put virgin there. So they're saying that the King James translators are wrong. Um, uh, Ashanti says, this is, this is what this is. Um, government does to push propaganda that they, they don't ask normal people to poll and then post their study of what they use our tax dollars on to publish in the media yeah there's an interesting book in australia called statistics lies and damn lies where they go through statistics and it's quite an old book it's like in the 90s but it just shows uh shows you you know how they go to a certain demographic of people and ask them specifically it's it's baited questions too they'll ring people up and say they'll only give you two choices and both of those choices make their opponent look bad and so you, you obviously have to choose one and so um they do these type of polls and so that's why i i never go um with polls except for when elections and things like that are happening because people are so so blinded that they actually believe the polls so you can act can actually go with the polls <laughs> with if you go with the stats and things like that it, it, it's not true but if you go with people's emotion and their uh, um, emotion filled at election time it's like you know all the sheep they just have a stampede and then um you can actually go with the polls because that's it's sort of like that's the direction the carrot's going and they're following the carrot and it's like it doesn't matter if it's true or not you can go with those polls you know um to make their agenda more acceptable uh, a lot of people are waking up to the evils that's been done yeah um i meant to say this is what the you yeah um this is what the yeah the government does i mean it happens everywhere and um i, I think people who don't think these things happen <laughs> like mark ward doesn't seem to believe in the conspiracy theory it's like what's wrong with you i mean um did, didn't you just see what happened with the world with everyone had to go and get medicine or else you know and the, the first videos they had of coming out of china were all these people dying like walking on the street and just falling over and dying <laughs> it's like uh, just pure propaganda and now we look back at it and it's like that wouldn't happen no, you get a cough, you might get in bed. And if it did affect you, if you one in a thousand, if you want one of those ones, you'd probably you know, be in a sick bed for a while. And, you know, you've already got something wrong. You wouldn't just be walking in the street healthy and, healthy and just fall over. But that seems to be happening now. <laughs> it's, it's so weird. Um, but, yeah. Um, I meant to say what the US government does. Yeah, and um, once you understand the CIA is basically like a mafia. Um, and, you know, I, I understand if I wasn't a Christian in America, I'd just go, yeah, we're, we're the boss. <laughs> we overthrow countries. We we bomb, bomb the heck out of anyone who stands in our way and you better not stand in our way. And we're, whether they, we're robbing you blind or stealing your resources or forcing you to buy our weapons and or whatever it's like we're the boss and so that's just how rome was um it's just the way life is um 
And now the media is saying that the death tolls were overcounted from two years ago. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff coming out here too. And people quitting before, you know, just, just as all the flack comes, they, they quit, you know, for some reason. Um, the New Zealand Prime Minister just quit yesterday. And so um, they she's about to face an election and the backlash of what she's done. And she actually, uh, any babies who were born overseas during that time uh, were not, considered New Zealand citizens if they didn't they had to come in and get the jab and all this sort of stuff and so yeah it's quite amazing how um here in Australia and New Zealand like we can just go straight into communist mode overnight <laughs> and um we have way less freedoms than, than they do in America uh, I know it looks free it looks nice on the postcard but when when you turn around um yeah so anyway i don't want to get into whole COVID rant let's continue the niv the new international version was partly done in order to kind of correct that kind of that kind of change exactly that uh, it's my understanding i yes. mean i was on that committee but my understanding from reading some of the his historiography around it that that was why and as as you probably know the um, revised standard version was was received by truman president truman on the steps of um, the oh. capitol building i think the capitol building oh. um, if that's right and so there was a big hoopla about it and and the american participation in that translation was really important and you know the the sort of arrival of american new testament scholarship in the post-war period, I think symbolized by that translation as well as other work on the Greek New Testament that scholars were doing in the United States at that time and really contributing to um, New Testament scholarship in a different way in the post-war period. And then everybody, or not everybody, people like your grandfather, uh, were not happy with those decisions and, and they were actually book burning. So the Revised Standard Version was burned. Um, you know what's amazing? If you listen through the the clips that james white has he has four of these of her of him talking to gail ripplinger when they talk about this issue he says that he made a stand against bible perversions so this was what like even people who were critical texts saw this as a bible perversion because of these type of readings and so um like they, they actually had in the because uh, the new testament came out in um 1946 then it was 1952 they brought out the new and the old but the new had changed a lot as well that's what they did with the new king james they had um an edition come out in 1979 was very close to the king james but just updated then they brought it out in 1982 with the old testament and a revised new testament which was completely different <laughs> not completely but a whole bunch of words were changed you know so um, it's quite deceptive how they do this. Um, but um, I understand that things you know, can change over time, but oftentimes they, they've changed for the worse. They haven't gone closer to a King James reading. They've departed you know, and gone towards a more West Scott and Hort type of definition, which you, usually you'll find in Strongs and Vines and things like that. Um, and so what they had in... Um, Matthew chapter 1, verse, I think it was verse 18, where it has the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was um, found with child. Actually, it might be verse um, 16. It talks about the um, Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So they actually have a footnote there, and it has... Um, like I, I, it's not like some manuscripts but it says some read or something like that and it has um the father of jesus like, like making out that joseph is the father of jesus okay and this this isn't in any greek it's in the syriac peshitta which is a syriac manuscript so that they've actually got this footnote with that in it. <laughs> it's quite amazing. I might actually just bring this up because I know I'm sort of fudging through this because it's been a couple of years since I actually went through that. So I'll just quickly go to my website. Um, and so we're looking at Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. Okay, let's zoom down here. Matthew chapter 1. And the issue of 
page blown up to 300%, which is not a good look. Yeah, revised standard version footnote. It has other ancient authorities read, Joseph, to whom was betrothed the Virgin Mary, was the father of Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, can you see where there's a problem there? So the virgin birth is massively attacked um, and so if you want to go to, I'll, I'll show you this here. This is um, on my website. So I've got the revised standard version footnote. So this is underneath Matthew 116. Okay. Revised standard version footnote. And it's got um, an article, 1953 article by Alva J. McLean. And so it goes through that issues. And so it says, first they say, this reading occurs in other ancient authorities. This sounds very impressive, but what are these ancient authorities and how many are there? Well, the answer to that is not even so much as one manuscript of the Greek New Testament that contains the above reading. It is found only in an old version, the Sinaitic Syriac, discovered in 1892. So just even that one line just shows you how deceptive. Um, and this is in 1952, okay, a Bible version coming out. Um, and... See, they're sort of like, oh, people were saying these are disgusting, and they go on to say that um, Metzger had a jar like full of ashes of a Bible that got sent to him, this Bible. Um, I mean, clearly, and these are just conservative guys. Many times these people, they're not against modern versions, but they're, they're against this, the way that these are translated. And so that's what I see sometimes when I'm, you know, Mark Ward is against, you know, the, the redefining of Arsene Koite. And he's like, oh, it shouldn't happen. And it's like, well, can't you just look further? Can't you just look at the NIV and, and these other ones? And there's so many wrong readings in these Bibles. See, the thing is, his standard is sort of like, like I remember I, I used to listen to this preacher once and he used to preach really good stuff. He had a visiting guy one time who preached a whole sermon on why abortion is bad. And I was just thinking, look, really, if you're a Christian, you wouldn't even question that. Like, <laughs> it's like saying, don't kill your mum. You know, it's like, oh, okay, you're going to do a whole sermon on that. You know, oh, okay. Well, I listened through it. It was, it was really boring because it's like, for a Christian, you you would never even consider that. It's, it's, just, it's just murdering someone, you know. Don't kill your son or, so, you know, it's like, you know, why do a whole thing on abortion, like to a church? I mean, fair enough if it's like, you know, it's a mixed group or, you know, you're trying to get your message across on the street or you're standing out in front of a whatever. But it's like, um, yeah, it just seemed really like, well, why would you even bother saying that? And so um, sometimes Mark Ward, he's he comes along and he just says things and it's just like, man, you you got to get your standards a little bit higher than this, Mark. you you're just sort of stating the obvious. I mean, it, the, the Passion Translation is bad. It's like, uh, really? What, you can't go through the NIV and see, but even James White is like, it's a liberal Bible. And he was defending it in his, um, in his book, but then he's like, now he's like, it's a liberal Bible. Why would he think that? Well, why wouldn't you go through those verses or contact him and say, hey, James, why do you think it's a liberal Bible? Oh, well, because of these 20 verses and read through them and go, yeah. It's liberal or, or it's not liberal or you know but see this just shows you that mark ward he's on the payroll <laughs> his latest video was just a big ad for for um logos bible software and i listened through it and i was like yeah what if i want the papal wisdom as well uh you know to come up do i just press p and it comes up you know the pope's head <laughs> um what if i want um you know, where does the where does the money go? I was, I was just I wrote a few questions, but they haven't been answered. I think he just ignores me. He's probably blocked me. I'm not sure if you get blocked on YouTube. Maybe this is a good question to ask you guys. If you get blocked on YouTube, do you still look like you're commenting, or do you just or can't you comment? Because I don't know anyone anyone who's actually blocked me on on. Sorry, I'm, I think I said Facebook on YouTube. Sorry. Um, 
he's blocked me on Facebook, but I'm pretty sure he would have blocked me on YouTube because a lot of his videos, I, I copy and paste my replies, but I don't get any likes, dislikes, responses. It's just like a zombie. And so, anyway, so Brother Incognito says, I suppose that Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and a Jew writing in the first century would know and speak Hebrew better than a translator of the Hebrew of Isaiah than Bart or Jennifer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it's it, it's just so clear. When something is brought over from the Old Testament and it's defined a certain way in the New Testament, it can be pretty clear that that's how that's a. I mean, God's involved with that. See. Jennifer, um, she believes the Bible should be understood as a human product. Um, she doesn't believe that the Bible is a divinely inspired text. These guys don't believe in inspiration. They believe it's probably from older myths. The, uh, what's it, the JPED theory and all that sort of stuff comes into it. And Ishati says, I heard a lot about what happened in your country while it was happening. Yeah. Um, it was quite amazing, in, especially in Victoria. I mean, people are just traumatised still by it. But people who had jobs for like 30 years were just, their lives were just absolutely ruined. And uh, and still today, we're going through a massive recession. Like inflation's just gone through the roof. Everything is just like doubled in price. The wages have stayed the same. And But, you know, all for something that only one in a thousand die from. Quite amazing. Um, Rebel News and other independent sources we're covering over here in the US. Yeah, and so we have uh, Arby Yemi, and so I kind of like Arby. The only thing I don't like is he um, basically joined the Israeli Defense Force and went over and specifically to shoot Gazans. <laughs> and it's like, dude, um, I know he's a secular guy and all the rest of it. It's sort of like, imagine you know, joining the military so you can, in, in the US just so you can you know, shoot the heads of, of Afghani kids or whatever it's like um it's not really yeah you know, i understand he's israeli and all the rest of it but sometimes there's a hyper is israeli type of thing see the the problem is israelis are actually very anti-christian and they persecute christians and 35 percent of palestinians are actually christian and they don't talk about that a lot and so many times these people are getting persecuted jesus was persecuted by jewish people <laughs> i mean so was paul and so sometimes when we see that it's like people they have this cognitive dissonance where they're like, oh, no, you always have to side with Israel. They're the good guys. And so these Christians are just like, okay, they just stole our land. What happens now? Well, they're the Jews. You need to run along, you um, raghead sort of thing. And it's like, uh, no, they're actually Christians. They're, they've been there for years and years and years. They have more right to the land than pretty much, you know, some guy who's got 25% bloodline. Of, um, who had a grandma who was Jewish. So it actually comes down to de definitions that Hitler made up so he would persecute jews to the um to the 25 percent level so if you had a grandparent one grandparent who was jewish you were considered a jew and you could end up in a camp and so that's why israel opened the doors up for everyone even if you had 25 percent. so many times you'll find that people in the land they've had a, a grandpa who's jewish I, I'm, I'm my grandma was jewish so i can go to israel i can go there and say well i'm I want to be part of Israel. Um, and so it, it's it's quite an interesting thing where you, they've got, you know, 75% Nigerian or 75% Papua New Guinean or 75% Canadian or Australian or American, but they can go over there and take land off Christians. <laughs> it's, and when, when you start digging underneath all this sort of stuff, there is quite a lot of questionable things happening. And so it's not just as black and white as like the good, the bad, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of things and yeah, friends of mine have been affected. Um, they have property in Bethlehem and we had um, plans for that, but uh, yeah, squatters came on the land and that was it. He just told me, oh, all the, all the plans of having, you know, like a museum there and doing all sorts of things in Bethlehem, don't worry about it. And I said, well, what's happening? He said, well, uh, the squatters are there on the land now. I said, well, what do you mean? Is that's it. And he said, yeah. He said, or else we become the ones who are like the kids throwing rocks and all that sort of stuff. You know, that once they're on the land, that's it. They own it. And they're, they're moving us backwards. And so we've, and we had a picture of his grandpa on the land in 16, uh, sorry, in 
1865. It was a very old photograph, and he was standing there in Bethlehem, big guy with a beard, and they have church records showing that you know, they had that property for years and years and years. So all it takes is someone with a Jewish grandpa who's Canadian head over there, go, I want this land, and sit there, um, set up a tent, build a shanty thing, you know, grow some locks, and it's like, that's mine. <laughs> and that's that's what's happening. And so that's what's happened to a good friend of mine. And so when people say, oh, that doesn't happen, I could tell you all the details. I could do 20 videos on that and tell you in depth about what's really happening there. Uh, it's not just as black and white as, you know, uh, people are making out, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, so um, that's interesting because a lot of uh, critical text advocates don't like even the mentioning of the Peshitta. Okay. Yeah, so this is... Um, you have the Syriac Peshitta, so it's different to the older type of Peshitta. There are different types, but they're basically both um, Syriac. So that's the similarity. So uh, I guess like you get the old Latin and then you've got the Vulgate. There is a difference. Um, interesting time we're living in with so many Christians going woke and many scholars conveniently supporting the woke narrative and even Bible translations going woke. Yeah, and this has been one of the issues. I remember Robert Trulove pointing out the gender-neutral Bibles. Now, I can understand at times, because so even in the King James it says, um, you know, not like a woman shouldn't have, you know, a whole bunch of uh, jewellery and things like that, but let it be uh, the hidden man of the heart. And so obviously, you know, today we'd say the hidden woman of the heart, like the hidden man of the heart. It's like, but we understand man was sort of generic for both man and woman back then. It still is to a certain extent now where we would say mankind and things like that. But um, so we would just say woman now, and, and most people would not be upset with that. Um, but they've sort of used those few examples and they're changing everything to them and, and um, we and us. And um, instead of um, you know, man, it's people. And, and, and sometimes it, it makes sense in a sense where you're talking to a mixed audience, you would say, you, you wouldn't say you men this. It's like you people or something like that. But they're going way further and they're just making out that there's no such thing as gender. And the thing is, too, um, it's the words in the Bible are usually male orientated in a sense where Adelphos is usually just to do with men. Um, and that was the same in English. It would just be man, mankind, men. And so um, it, it would carry across uh, exactly most of the time. But now we've got all these other factors involved and so you have to be a little bit more skillful in how you bring those things across because there is just a general uh, fluidity of uh, language, but then there's also this wave of you can't tell what a woman is and you can't say what, what a man is and these ridiculous type of claims. And so anyway, that gives you a bit of a background into the um, RSV. So... Um, so you had the RSV, then you had the new revised um, standard version, which was uh, what Bart Ehrman, he would have worked with, with Metzger on. Then you've got the new, new one. So that's what Jennifer Knuss is working on. So uh, it's sort of all over the place with these guys. But um, actually, we've got quite a lot of comments here I didn't see. Um, but how woke must the Bible translation become before Mark ward will admit it's woke yeah um he some of these guys don't want to state the obvious they don't want to talk about carlo martini they don't want to talk about george van smith there's a whole bunch of topics they don't talk about it's it's like the elephant in the room you're just standing there watching them do a lovely little video and behind them is this huge elephant or this neon sign saying you know apostasy in the church warning warning you know they'll point out a tiny little crumb where it's like yeah, he'll even say that the the Bible, her Bible translation is good. Just in this one place, he thinks it's bad, and it's like, what? Nowhere else is, is it bad, or you know? 
um it's the same on youtube okay okay with the blocking thing i think that was the updated nrsv should qualify as woke uh and it's and it kind of started with bruce metzger interestingly yeah bruce metzger was an absolute heretic he didn't believe in preservation he didn't believe in inspiration so bart ehrman comes along he's like i don't believe in these things and people are like oh you know and all he has to do is say i used to be a christian you know um half the time when people have these testimonies of how they left christianity i like to listen to what they used to do when they were christians and i go through it and i'm like I, I just can't see where they were christians there half the time it's like sometimes there is i'm, I'm not denying that that can happen but um a lot of the time it's just like i joined a church or i went to bible college or you know they just become so sort of religious i mean you, you join the club and that's about it not you became born again your whole life was radically changed and you're into it you were just no you 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 became religious and you just became more and more religious and then you went hang on this is really stupid and then you just announced that it was stupid where some people go oh i better not announce it's stupid because i'm still on the payroll you know the mega crowd here also covers geo politics make it make america great again yeah <clears throat> the zionist movement just sort a lot of christian views over here um yeah it, it is a shame because jesus was quite critical of israel back in his day um so was paul so were the the disciples i mean they were persecuted by these people if you if, and they were way closer to the bible back then if you criticize the government today which is completely secular uh, the labor zionist movement which has you know, deep roots in sabbatianism and if if you critique what they're doing um you are coming against the hand of god you know sort of thing it's like okay um yeah and sometimes it's just stating the obvious it's like they just like kids running along the beach and they they get bombed and it's like everyone will go that's that's an outcry this is bad and it's like no 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 they're god's chosen and you just they're going how does that work you know they just bomb these kids on the beach you know if i did that working for the australian government i would be put in jail i would be right you know pulled over the coals there would be problems and so um but and it's the whole black and white thing um there's no gray areas it's all the good and the bad and that's it there's good people and there's bad there's the heroes and there's the villains and it just becomes this fantasy story where it's not it's not like that it, there's there's a lot of issues on both sides because it's gone so long now that you've got your know, generational you know fourth generational people um being born in israel who whose parents went over there and did, you know took over land or whatever it's like colonialism you, you you know america practiced it with the american indians um english people they came over to australia and pretty much wiped out in some places were almost completely eradicated the aboriginals in tasmania that almost happened there are a few left but very few um massacres happen like even just locally here the 120 people pushed off a cliff aboriginal people killed even up until recently people getting poisoned um they were sending out poison flour to the local um aboriginal mission here trying to kill them and so uh, that's going back probably about 40 50 years and so this type of thing uh, happening to indigenous people because of our practice of colonialism and so but we usually our colonialism is usually like 100 years ago 200 years ago it's sort of like oh well we've forgotten about all that now where when you've just come into the land in sort of 1948 and you're practicing the same type of colonialism i mean it just it doesn't work in the modern era we we see the french were trying to do this you know with Al algiers and um there, there's a whole bunch of problems that happen when you're trying to do that in the modern era and you've got to you got to um package it a different way to people like you know and i think the whole thing was you know the jews were coming out of europe from hitler 
to the life. Oh, we're, we're the victims, but they were creating victims as well. And so that, that's one of the things. And all this stuff, I mean, you know, some people say I'm anti-Semitic just for saying this. I mean, I've got I've got books on my shelf, you know, written by Jews specifically, um, you know, The Secret War Against the Jews. I've read that. I've read Rat Lines. I've read The Unholy Trinity, The Swiss Banks, Hitler and the Vatican. You're going through all the crimes of the Nazis and all that. I know about all that very well. Um, but then there's a whole other side of the coin of, um, you know, it's not like every Jewish person just had butter, wouldn't melt in their mouth, and they, they were just... They're just perfect people. You know that they, they went there and they did wrong things, just like Americans did wrong things, Australians do. But if you mention that you're you're a bad guy, apparently, where I just like to say, well, this what this is what happened. This is the truth. This happened on this side. This happened on that side. Yes, of course, they were attacked by the Arabs and all that sort of stuff. And um, and what it comes down to is a, to a nostalgic um, concept of, you know, the promised land and everything like that. What's amazing is the, the most people who believe in a pre-millennial, um, you know, might be pre-trib rapture or post-trib rapture or whatever, but most of it's pre-millennial. I'm a pre-trib guy. We usually acknowledge that there's going to be a third temple built and the antichrist is going to sit in there. <laughs> and so it's like, it's not, going to be like a godly society sort of thing i mean um you know tel aviv is is the homosexual capital of the world so a lot of christians would look at that and go well um <laughs> that's not that that's that's not really what god's chosen people should be doing and and um yeah i, I know lots of jewish people and most of them have no no thought that the bible is true it's just a cultural thing to them. It's just like, you know, it's like Christmas. You go to a bar mitzvah, you do your thing. It's just tradition. They don't believe in Noah's flood. They believe in evolution. They believe in all that. They, they're not like, yeah, there are some Orthodox people out there, but the vast majority of Jewish people are simply non-believers. They're secular. Anyway, I don't know why I'm talking about that so much, but I guess it's coming in the comments. Squatters sounds like California. <laughs> uh, wokeism itself is Marxism. Yes, pretty much. Man in the meaning human being. Yes, human being. Yes, very good. In the KJV, the word did not only mean male. Yeah, that's right. And so that's where there's a bit of confusion sometimes. Nick, that's gender theory. It's Marxism that came from the Londonburg uh, University. Okay. Uh, correction, it's Frankfurt School in Germany. Okay. All right, let's get back to the video. Um, in some context. Uh, so there, I mean, people care. There's a lot at stake in terms of how different words are translated and the kinds of investments people have in certain um, theological and doctrinal concerns. And so when the Bible changes, it can be shocking for people, especially if they're not trained in the Greek and the Hebrew. And most people aren't like who has time. <laughs> so like most people. If you're not trained in the Greek and the Hebrew, you can be shocked. So, you know, obviously they'll, they try to make out, Mark Ward constantly tries to make out that people like you and me could never learn another language, you know. I mean, um, you yeah, know, knowing people who are received text people who are Greeks, who speak Greek, who read the Bible in Greek and, you know, but, you know, they what would they know about their own language? <laughs> it's as if they've been speaking Swahili for, you know, 2,000 years. All of a sudden, you know, Bible Scott, the Anglo Sanhedrin come along and they're like, this is this is what Greek is. And anyone outside of that box is just like, no, you don't really understand Greek. And so, and as we saw before, Bart Ehrman said, we fudge our way with a dictionary and it, he's considered one of the, the main Greek scholars in the academy. And he's basically admitted that he doesn't really know much. And so um, let's continue. 
people just read it in right. English, right. and right. why would they have yeah, yeah. to, you know, read the Hebrew and the Greek? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you're right. The RSV was was burned sometimes publicly, and my so as you were mentioning, my my teacher, my mentor was Bruce Metzger, who was the chair mm -hmm. of the New Revised Standard Version Committee, but he was also on the Revised Standard Version back in the 1940s and oh, really? 50s. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so he had a in in the office I worked in. There was this metal box that had ashes in it, and he loved showing it to people because it was a uh, it was ashes from a, a North Carolina pastor who had taken the blowport blowtorch to the NR to, to the RSV in the 1950s and had sent the ashes to the uh, chair of the committee. And so Metzger wow. would show off this thing of ashes. And he'd, he'd always say that he's just glad that in the modern world, they, they burn a copy of the translation rather than the translator. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, actually, and great. Yeah, um, people back then had more sense. They, they knew when they saw uh, heresy, and so a lot of people probably wouldn't have gotten Westcott and Hort's um, trash or, or the American revised version, you know, the 1901 uh, edition. Um, but, you know, obviously this one came on the scene in 1946 and in uh, 1952, the, the complete Bible. And people were smart enough to go, this is just trash. This is wrong. And this guy's burnt it and sent it to Metzger. And Metzger's using it pridefully like, you know, like uh, these guys um, have just a history of not um, complying with biblical standards of just being heretics. And so I guess the a lot of people don't know what's going on behind the scenes. It's it's like you're half the time you, you look at a government and you think, oh, everything's fine. And then, you know, some scandal happens, like, um, you know, the Iran-Contra affair happens and, you know, um, Ollie Woods there testifying and saying, yeah, we're selling weapons to the Iranians and to the Iraqis at the same time. Um, yeah, we're, we've given them uh, chemical weapons and all this sort of stuff, and we're using that money for the Contras in in Nicaragua and all these type of <laughs> bizarre things are happening. And so you, you start to question the government, you know, it's like the uh, Woodstock, um, Woodstock, um, uh, what's it called? It's the major thing that happened in, in the United States um, politics in the 1960s. Um, Not Woodstock. Um, someone help me here. I'm having a goldfish moment. Um, so Helg says, burn the translations in the translator. That's kind of funny. Yeah. Um, I guess back in the day, they were burning translators for actually translating the Bible properly. Now they're perverting it and all they're doing is burning the book and sending it to them. And these guys are sort of using that as like a persecution complex, like, oh, they're persecuting us, so we're just like Tyndale, you know. And it's amazing how they name their Bible societies, you know, Tyn Tyndale House and, um, you know, Wycliffe Bible Society, but they really have nothing to do with these. They're, they're like Tyndale House, Wycliffe, but they're, deep in bed with the Roman Catholics. And so it's kind of strange. Um, Great story. I mean, good. wow. <laughs> so, okay. But so, the, so different, tra so different committees then. So you have committees, you have committees translating these things. Is that, is that generally the way it works? I mean, those are the, the New Testaments that I read, the ones that are translated by committee. I, there are some um, individuals who have made individual translations, and I can understand why they might want to do that, because, you know, as, as even myself, if I'm reading from the Greek, I'm not necessarily going to follow any of the translations in my own thinking around, oh, I actually think this is what, you know. Yeah. Yeah. this writer is trying to say, or this book is maybe better translated is this way, because because I read Greek, but um, but the committee, you know, th these committees are responsible not only to themselves and their own sensibility about, oh, I think this means that, but also to a broader set of institutional contexts. And so the committee translations um, are representative of institutions, it seems to me. Okay. So if, so we do have... So that's interesting um, because you got someone like Tyndale, you know, translating, and obviously the King James Bible uses a lot of Tyndale. 
and that scene is quite a faithful um, Bible translation. You know, Luther worked on his. And then you have the King James Translation Committee, which is an ideal situation. But see, the problem is if you have a corrupt committee and they want it done in a certain way, you, you have to bow to that. Now, fortunately, um, King James, he had enough sense to only put a few rules there that he saw were um, extremes of the Puritans and Presbyterians. Um, and so, you know, obviously, you know, not having church in the Bible, but it was actually Geneva that introduced uh, church back into the Bible after Tyndale, because when Tyndale was around, church was a church was like a, a swear word, you know what I mean? But then the church became cleaned up. And so obviously a hundred years later, words can change, you know, and so they reintroduced the word church, which is a good word. And I think it's great that they did that. Um, and so, but then they're coming against individual translations uh, now and saying, oh, they can have biases and things like that. But the thing is, you can have just as much bias if you're working for Thomas Nelson or working for a group that, you know, 25% of them work on the NIV. Let's like with the New King James, a lot of them were NIV translators who jumped on board. And so um, you can you can have just as many you, just as many translators as the King James, but um, you can have this type of bias. And so that's what... Uh, just saying that. I guess we do have some translations by individuals, people who just sit down and, and um, you know, probably a lot of New Testament scholars get asked by their students, why don't you do one? <laughs> you know, the, the idea, you know you're just kind of, which you could you could do, obviously. Yeah. But so um, so what are there? Are there so there? Do you think it's a better idea to do it by yourself? You, you say the inst I mean, committees have institutions behind them and it's not yes. clear. Is that a good thing or not a good thing? Oh, I think it's good, but I think it should be recognized by the readers, right? Okay. So I think sometimes people don't bother to read the prefaces to their translations. And right. so if they're not reading the preface, they're not understanding historical context within which that translation was made. And yeah. every translation is a sort of encapsulation of the priorities of that, in, of the people involved at that time, which are in turn set in a context. And that context will inform choices that are made and people should know that choices are made and that these are not just, you know, word for word translations. I mean, it's impossible anyway. Because it's impossible to have a word for word translation. <laughs> okay. Well, I, Greek get, and I, definitely, I definitely, I definitely, Greek and English. <laughs> no, it is possible. I definitely wanted to get to that, about why it's impossible, yeah. but I'm, I'm interested in the committee idea because it seems like on one level, if you've got an individual doing it, you could get kind of their individual genius about it, right? And, or, you sure. know, like in a particular take. But on the other hand, you get all their idiosyncrasies, right? Yeah, yeah. Like they've got weird views about this, that, or the other, because everyone does. And and yeah. that gets into the translation then. But if you have a committee, I mean, it sounds like, you know, um, you know, like novels are not written by committees usually. And so, right. so like, it must be, how, how do they do it? I mean, in other words, suppose you... Well, obviously, you don't write, you're not writing the Bible, you're translating the Bible. It's not like a novel. It's not like you're sitting down with a blank piece of paper saying, who's, let's brainstorm, let's just get some ideas, you know. Um, you're going through and you're looking at previous texts. You And the thing is, um, these guys seem to want to continually update the text. Um, and they're moving further away from their earlier editions, which means that their earlier editions, they must be admitting that their early editions have mistakes in them. Because why would they be updating them? Why would they, why would um, Jennifer, Jennifer Knust be so interested in you know, um, Koite, um and those type of concepts if she didn't think that the earlier editions were corrupted? And all pretty much all the Bibles up until you know her one comes out. And so um Bart Ehrman's actually, you know, saying something true here is that there are these idiosyncrasies that can creep into um the writing of um translators. And so this is one of the things with having a, a committee. But see, if you're with a bunch of people who aren't on your team, if you're if you mm -hmm. jump in with a, a bunch of liberals and you're going to translate things um obviously 
it's not really going to work. And so you have to almost be of the same mind to do a translation. You have to be of the same type of, at least the same religion. <laughs> you know what I mean? Half of these people are atheists, agnostics, and then lots of them are Catholic, lots of them are liberal, you know, all they're all over the place. And so I don't know, I don't know how you can get anything that makes any sense from some of these committees. I mean, you've got sometimes it's your Catholics, sometimes you've got uh, Methodists, you've got Pentecostals, you've got Baptists, you've got Calvinists, you've got Reformed, you've got all sorts of people there. And so there are certain ways that, um, you know, th there's certain things that, that can creep into the text. And I see it all the time, like say with the, with the New King James, I was pointing out the other day where when it says uh, weakness, um, in the New King James, sometimes that can be um, a way of talking about infirmities. Now, there were two different ways of looking at infirmities. Infirmities were sicknesses that made you weak or infirmities were just weaknesses in your life. And so you could be like, um, oh, we're having problems. And so, and that was sort of called like infirmities. It wasn't a sickness though. But the New King James translates this as infirmities when it's dealing with sickness. But then when you start getting into the, you know, pieces of Paul and um, all the letters, you start going through and it has infirmities has been translated as weakness. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Until you get to the passage where Paul's talking about the thorn in his side and, you know, how most people say, oh, that's, he had sickness, you know, um, where when you read through that, it's, it never mentions sickness there. Um, it's, actually, it's more so like he had persecution because he prayed three times and God said, my grace is sufficient for you. But it actually says that this thorn in the side was given to him. Be, and thorn in the side is directly related to the Old Testament where it talks about um, the enemies of God being a thorn in, in Israel's side. And so he was talking about these Jewish people who followed me around from town to town and nearly beat me to death. There is thorn in my side, side God. Um, can you take it from me? But Jesus promised you will have, you know, all these things in life and persecution. You know, those who want to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So he's prayed three times it would depart from him. It hasn't. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you, but my strength is made, um, made perfect in weakness and all this sort of stuff. But the New King James actually doesn't translate it there as... as um, when they go through where infirmity is in the King James, they translate that as we, uh, as infirmities. They don't read translate it as weakness because they think that it's a an infirmity, which is a sort of usually a quick, easy sort of fix to um, you know people trying to uh, combat an argument of cessationism, which is a really poor argument. But they've put it in that Bible anyway, and it's like. Um, you know, while Paul suffered from these things, it was probably sickness. You know, he wrote with large letters, you know, because he was half blind. He would have taken his eyes out and, or they would have taken their eyes out and given them to you because, well, there must have been problems with his eyes. No, it's talking about, yeah, I'll cut my arm and leg off for you. I'll do, oh, there must be something wrong with your legs. You know, it's like, no. Um, so, so this type of thing um, oftentimes is read into these Bibles. New King James has, you know, Paul writing with big letters, you know, like A, B, you know, because he's half blind. Not like a, a big long letter. It's a big letter. <laughs> like he wrote with his own hand. He didn't have an amanuensis um, he was dictating to. He wrote it all with his own hand because it was so important. Um, but, yeah, it's quite amazing um, how things are read into these verses and how doctrines are changed because of people sitting on these commissions. So what would you rather have, you know, that type of thing, or would you rather have someone just faithfully going through and changing that to weakness all the way through rather than putting their bias into the text? I know some people would want it in there. Some people wouldn't. I've studied through that and I, I can't find sickness in there at all with Paul's thorn. It's just, just non-existent. It's read into it. And so Bible translators are reading that into the text as well. So. How's it, I mean, are you, is a group in a room, like a, the committee in a room, and they're all deciding what to, how to translate this particular verse? 
Well, maybe I could speak about my own experience on the NRSV updated edition. Um, so that was done via Zoom because okay. it was a lot of it was done in co during COVID, right? But I, my understanding is is that in the old days that they really were men sitting together in a room making these just men decisions. But um, in my case, um, we met as. Um, as an editorial board online because that was the COVID days. Um, so the way it worked with us is the bo individual book editors. So I was one of the general editors of the New Testament with Mike Holmes. Um, so Mike Holmes. So I'll just let you know who Mike Holmes is because he's quite famous. Um, other Mike Holmes is around. So this is Mike Holmes. Um, Princeton, um, the former chair of Department of Biblical and Theological Studies um, at Bethel University, St. Paul, Minnesota. He's taught at Bethel since 1982. Um, so yeah, he's he's been, he's worked on quite a lot of things. The Greek New Testament, uh, SBL edition. And so uh, I remember seeing this up in Papua New Guinea in Bougainville. Uh, we went to the Bible societies there and I asked them what Greek text to use. And they showed me this SBL edition. They said, you, you can have a copy if you want. We've got it right here. And I said, uh, no, OK, thanks. <laughs> I just thought, I don't know. I don't, I'm, what am I going to do with it? Like, I, I used to just put everything on my shelf and all that, but it's just like, and after a while, there, there's so many editions coming out and it's just, but let's have a look at it. And most of the time you can get everything online now. Okay, you can't get that one online. But um, context determines the understanding of the author's use of the word infirmity, whether actual sickness or character flaws, or as in the case of the Apostle Paul's a messenger from Satan. Yep. And so, um, yeah, that's very important. And that's what I noticed that they, they went with the context that it was sickness. So that's why they reverted back to infirmities uh, rather than weakness, which is quite interesting. Okay, so I'm, I'll just continue with the video. My counterpart and we together um, identified and invited book editors who were experts, known experts on the books that we invited them to offer suggestions about. Um, and then they, the book editor would submit comments and ch suggested changes. And then as individual general editors, we would go through that and we would be responsible for doing a first pass of, oh, accept this change, reject that change, discuss this change based on our mandate. And then we would get together as an editorial board to discuss. So the thing that I appreciated about that process is that to translate the Bible is an extremely serious activity that should be done very carefully because people who don't have access to the original languages shouldn't be, should not be misled by the translator to the degree possible, it seems that, or as, as we put it, um, that's, we had our slogan, which comes way back. I think the RSV had this slogan too. I just I want to get it right. Um, as literal as possible, as free as necessary. I think that's, that is like, that was, whatever that, that means. That was a Metzger. <laughs> There's a Metzger came up with that. And yeah, uh, yeah okay, that's how so, they did the NRC. But, but so, okay. Yeah. You know, what would be really good. Um, maybe some of you guys in America could do this. Um, some of you guys who know Greek fluently. Now, I know there are some guys um, who I've got contact with and they've, they're really proficient in Greek and they're constantly reading through their Greek New Testaments and they, could, they can speak modern Greek. And, and what would be great is to see Jennifer Knust and, and hold a microphone to her and, and have a camera and just say, uh, and just start talking in Greek and just start asking questions and, and just ask them, you know, how the weather is and all the rest of it. And do the same to Bart Ehrman and do the same to James White and just see what their proficiency in Greek is. Um, it's quite interesting. They've done, some people have done these type of tests where they've been in a room full of scholars and they've asked them what a certain word means. And it's quite a basic word and no one knew. And it just shows you the level of scholarship that is there today, which we heard Bart Ehrman basically admit that he doesn't know. Okay, so you've got a group of people on Zoom, 
or yeah. uh, or you're right. I mean, usually it used to be in a room, and <laughs> maybe it won't be in rooms anymore. But uh -huh. but um, but so but uh, presumably not everybody agrees on true what you know like how to translate a word or how to translate a verse. So what happens when there's a disagreement? Well, um, we discuss it and weigh various options, and we actually would reach a consensus um, based on you know. As a member of a committee, we don't always get our way, right? We have to be sensitive to the various concerns and reach a reach a consensus that may or may not be representative of any individual point of view. Yeah. But a consensus usually the term consensus means that everybody agrees. And I can't imagine yeah. a Bible translators, everybody in a room or on a Zoom agreeing. So does it come down to a majority vote? Um I'm trying to remember an instance when we I don't think we ever had a contentious vote about anything. I think we uh -huh. we would come to an agreement um, that for all different sorts of reasons, this is what it had to be. I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess I can let me give you an example that I found personally difficult. And I'm speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for the board. I'm speaking for myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you know, the, one of the most difficult words to translate in the New Testament is the word doulos and its related terms. So do, the word doulos means slave. And, you know, those of us who are historians of that era know that a third of the population of the Roman Empire was enslaved. And while slaves had all enslaved persons had all different kinds of jobs. So one could be, for example, a slave of the imperial household and be quite well off, in fact, better than most people in a given city if you were managing the emperor's accounts in, you know, Af um, aphrodisias or something. Um, many slaves, most slaves, probably the vast majority were not, you know, lived terrible, um, terribly abject circumstances where masters could make decisions about their their bodies in all different kinds of ways. OK, so that's our background as as um you know, people who work on the New Testament and who've been thinking about this problem of slavery or enslaved persons in the New Testament for a long time. And there's so much really great work on this question. And as you know, this is a particularly live question in the United States where we have a history of slavery, right? Where, uh, and, and the use of the Bible to defend slavery um, in our own context. So it's a very difficult question. So what do you do about the translation of this term? Now, there is a video that she brings out that talks about how people use the Bible um, to condone slavery. And I, I found it very biased because the very people who were enslaved were looking to that same Bible for their freedom. And so um, the, the King James is very clear. It just says uh, a servant, you know, and so... Um, the modern terminology of slave obviously that's become quite you know a hot button topic uh in the united states you know the whole george floyd thing and and other issues um but you know the whole thing with slavery just constantly rears its head you know it's it's like something that um yeah i i, I watched this um footage of this russian guy and he said uh, no, he was an Irish guy, and he came over to the United States, and they were trying to um, make him feel guilty about slavery. And he said, yeah, "We were slaves, <laughs> you know, for the British. You were, what are you talking about? Why? Why? Just because I look white, I'm supposed to be? A, I'm a slave owner or something?" And the thing was, uh, I think it was only like four percent of Americans actually owned slaves, and so um, there, there's there's a whole lot of misconception around this type of topic as well. But it is an emotive topic. Everyone's got an opinion on it. And, you know, people like me just get thrown into the racist bag just because of how I look. You know. um, but at the end of the day, the, the King James just says a servant. I know the New King James says bond servant, but it's sort of like a lot of people wouldn't know what bond servant is. Um, I think this has become a bit of an obsession. People want to put slave in there. Um, people want that type of controversy. They want it to be controversial because then it justifies having the next update. Oh, we had to get rid of that concept, you know, so. Well, um, often what has been done is that in some cases the word is translated slave and in some cases the word is translated servant. 
um, when people might be offended. Like, for example, Paul calls himself slave of, of Christ. Um, and normally or often the NRSV and the RSV do this, translate this as servant, Paul's servant of Christ. Uh, and even in the Magnificat, when Mary says, you know, handmaid, I think is a, a KJV, um, she, what she's actually saying is female slave. Yeah. So the book editors, I think pretty much universally recommended that the... In not, uh, not just a servant, because it's almost like servants have completely disappeared from the biblical world. You've either just got landowners and slaves now. It's like... What would you call someone in the middle? Someone who, if I saw King David and loved what he was doing and went and served him, am I his slave now? You know, I'm his, I'm, I'm his servant. You know, I'm, people did things, you know, Mary's like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the handmaiden of the Lord. So in other words, I'm, I will, I'm a servant. And so she seems to think that slave is the best translation. Now, slave is what the New World Translation used. Whenever I read that, when I was first a Christian, I would read these things. It's like a slave of Jesus. I'm thinking, a slave? <laughs> it's, no wonder you guys are so boring and in a cult. You're, you're slaves. You know, it was just, it was quite obvious. Um, I'm just going to read through some of these comments because they're coming in fast. Jim D says, Nick, two questions regarding the King James Version. What's your views on the repeated slurs that the King James that King James insisted on use of clerical terms, bishops for elders and church for congregation. So bish, bishops comes from the Greek episkopos or biskopos, became bishop. Um, so it's very close to the Greek there. Um, and it's perfectly fine English word that came in from Latin. Um, and that was well understood uh, in 1611. We mightn't use that. Uh, as much today, um, but it's not a mistranslation and King James insisting that we use um, a word like that, um, that that's fine. It's, it's, it was perfectly fine. Um, uh, word church, congregation. Um, so Tyndale in his day, he changed everywhere where Ecclesia is to congregation because the church had become so corrupt. But 100 years later, you've got good churches and an understanding that it's not just a building or, or an institution, but it's, we're all, you know, the church. We are, we're, all part, we're all part of a body called the church. And so um, all these concepts exist. The church can be a, a place of congregation. The church can be a, a group of people. Um, the church can be, um, it's made up of individuals. And so the Bible talks about this. We're like precious stones where we're built up into a holy place, a holy temple. And so we are the church and all this sort of stuff. And so the King James, they translated church for the believers. So that's why sometimes in the Old Testament it talks about the church in the wilderness. Um, and then for, sometimes I get these mixed around, but I think it's um, congregation is... Um, for the Jews, so uh, it'll talk about the, the congregation, um, and that's specifically talking about Jewish people, and then the assembly is like a mix, whether it's yeah, Christians or Gentiles or Jews, or it's a mix of people. And so they specifically put these three words into their correct uh, semantic range. Um, and so um, there was a really good article written by a guy called Keith Mason, about church and um i've got it on my hard drive somewhere i really should revisit it and um in one of the debates i did and i, I got right to the point on that but um I, sometimes you know there's so much information coming my way that um i'm sure that half of it just goes in one ear straight out the other <laughs> but um yeah so hopefully that helps a bit we are enslaved now and just don't know it yeah in many ways we are there's certain things that you can't do just even as a human you if you just start behaving in a certain way it might even be sin or more or illegal but the whole society will turn against you and so um some of us know it uh henna uh most pastors that i've heard preach and teach never use the bible to justify slavery black or white what is she talking about um, 
what she's talking about is um, there were some people back in the day saying, you know, that slavery was okay um, because uh, in the uh, Old Testament it does talk about, you know, if you have someone who is a slave and, um, you know, like the whole thing, if they want to remain in your house and you put the, you know, the, their ear up to the door and you put a mark on their ear and all this sort of stuff, There's, it goes into detail about these things. But we're talking about ancient Israel, not Christianity. And so, and the Bible does talk about if you uh, are you know, in in a sense where you are in a in a situation where you're encaptured, I guess, but you become a Christian. It it talks about using your testimony there um, powerfully for those people. Like you've got this opportunity to preach to them, to share the gospel with them. You know, do that, you know, as well. So. Um, I don't think the Bible ever really in, in Christianity um, says that slavery is okay. And when you look at the history of the anti-slavery movement, it was headed up by Christians. And so you have like William Wilberforce. Uh, he actually started the Bible societies in 1804, but he was um, known for being um, one of the guys who came against slavery. And so then when you look at, what happened in, in the United States uh, with the Civil War and with the um, was it proclamation of emancipation with um, Lincoln. So people were, um, slaves were set free. But oftentimes, you know, people were set free um, according to the books. But then it's like, you know, 70 years of, I think they call them like Jim Crow laws or something like that, but I could be wrong. I'm just, it's just a word that came to my mind. I might just type it in Jim Crow. Um, yeah, Jim Crow laws that enforce racial segregation in the South. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Jim Crow laws. And so it was sort of like if you were found loitering, you could go to jail. And so people were just waiting for a bus and police would come and just pick them up for loitering and they would spend the rest of their life in jail. Uh, testimonies of this type of thing. And so um, uh, it was about 4 or 5% in the South had slaves. Yeah, so it's like uh, all of a sudden every white person is a... Uh, I figured out the word, what the word cracker means. I guess it's a whip cracker. I, said, I, I was thinking of a biscuit, like, oh, we got skin like a biscuit, but it's like more like a, a whip cracker. You were always wanting to be the boss, you know. <laughs> um, the South used slaves to produce trade for the Brits. Okay. Um, what happened to indentured servants or voluntary servitude? Yeah. It sounded like she was referring to today here in America about the justification of slavery. Uh, it was Jim Crow. Um, after the war, Lincoln wanted to deport the freed slaves back to Africa. Well, that's interesting. Any time that the word doulos is translated servant, it be translated as slave. This is the NRSV. The NRSV UE. updated edition. The, so the, the NRSV, okay. the, the old NRSV follows the rule of having Paul's servant, for example. Huh. The updated edition, the initial discussion was we should just be consistent and use the word slave. Okay. Um, or enslaved person in, ca in cases where it's clear that, like, for example, Paul, slave of God, Paul's declaring himself to be slave. But in other cases, if we're talking about slaves, let's use enslaved because those people aren't choosing slave. They're like, yeah, let me be a slave. So like enslaved person in that case. That was kind of the consensus of the editorial board. But it went back to the National Council of Churches and there was a huge debate about it because it was really offensive actually to many of the member churches in the National Council of Churches, including historically black congregations uh -huh. who felt really like, no, they don't want to, you know, that's not the same to say when Paul calls himself slave of God, that's not the same, right? That's not, he's not declaring that he wants to be enslaved by God. You know, he's, and we don't want to do anything that gives the impression that God's want, God wants humanity to be enslaved would have been, you know, the art, that argument. Yes. And so ultimately the National Council of Churches is the copyright holder for the New Revised Standard Version and now the New Revised Standard Version updated edition. And so they're the ones who make the final decision 
about yeah. what's in the text. Yeah. And so what ended up happening is that even though the uh, um, initially the editorial board of scholars right, had recommended translating doulos as slave or slave language in every case, what ended up happening is that when um, the term is being used to describe a person, you know, who's accepting that role, servant language continued to be employed. So um, I myself, as a as a scholar, would prefer that doulos be consistently um, translated as slave throughout or enslaved, because I, my sense as a scholar and, you know, in, when I'm teaching is that I want students to wrestle with what it means to have a text that's produced in a slave holding context and what, what it means, the history of that, of the use of those texts, even in the United States and, and how to wrestle with scripture as an authority that's used even in something as abhorrent as slavery. So that's, as a scholar, that's what I prefer. But um, because these texts are not only used in classrooms and um, they're used in churches, the decision of the National Council of Churches was no, we, you know, we're not going to do that. We'll put in footnote. So you'll notice that there'll be a footnote, you know, Greek slave, but the word is sometimes continues to be um, translated as servant. And so there is an instance where, and again, I didn't agree with that, but we didn't vote. I'm like, okay, I accept, I accept that decision. Like I understand the logic of that decision, even though it's not my preference. Yes. So we didn't ask people to vote. It was more like, okay, yeah. that the reasoning there is legitimate. And so, so there's a different, it. there's a different Greek word for servant. Correct. Uh, and that's, that's translated as servant. Correct. And is doulos ever translated as slave in the uh, updated edition? Yes, yes. When it when um, in instances where like in the slave parables in the Gospels, right, where wow. there's slaves or yeah. in instances when when Paul or the Pauline epistles or, oh. um, you know, first Peter talking about enslaved persons and how slaves should behave and the, like the household codes. This, these okay. are translated um, with the word slave, uh, which is appropriate because slaves in particular are being addressed. So yeah, no, there's there's lots of examples okay. where, where doulos and doulos related words are translated as slaves. I see. Yeah, but it's the consistency. That That's one of the hard things, I think, for translations is uh, just generally whether, yeah. I mean, this is this is obviously a sticky situation for uh, for um, religious reasons, church Absolutely. reasons. For, and so it's a very difficult issue. Um, yes. But but even when you're just translating anything, I mean, you, you know, the question is, do you slavishly follow a particular translation? In other words, you this is how I've translated this right to the yeah. chapter in a different right. context. Right. Right. It's, it's kind right. Of, Right, Tricky. because maybe a different maybe a different book has a different nuance to that term, yes. right? Because we have these are these are you know twenty seven books by different people by and large yeah. only, but you know, and yeah. so they they might use a word differently, you know, yeah. each. Have, but yeah. even if you're translating, you know, a, in a French novel, I mean, you still have to decide. <laughs> it's not that you translate the word the same way every time. You, you exactly. Have to, you vary it depending because the new. So could you just say something about that? I mean, it, it sounds it sounds like that's a great illustration of. How how the nuances of a language are very difficult to translate. I mean, you could, yes. you could just say, you know, this word means that, this word means this, and and just like then mechan you just feed it into a computer, right? Say what the word means, and the yeah. word the computer will chunk out a translation. But like it doesn't work that way, right? <laughs> definitely not. No, definitely not. You have to make decisions. Which is so strange because half of the time, I'm dealing with people who say, oh, it says love in the Bible. It should read love all the way through. What about charity? Charity's wrong. It should have love, you know, or it's got Easter in the Bible. You know, 28 times it's translated, Pascha is translated as Passover. Um, you've got this one time Easter. Why isn't it consistent? You know, and so they're sort of like saying, oh, you know, you punch it into a computer and it comes out and it should all read the same. It should be consistent like that. But where these guys are like, oh, no, you can't do that because every context um matters yeah, everything's different you know with a word like this you've got to be sensitive and so it's, it's the exact opposite of uh, oftentimes what you hear people um blabbing on about uh, many times in debates decisions because the languages are different i have so many examples but, but maybe an, an easy one for the nrs the update would be the word adelphoi which means brothers yes. or siblings 
siblings would probably be a better translation, although we don't use that word enough in English, but siblings maybe is the way to go with a Delph a Delphoi, right? Yeah, but so, the siblings doesn't have an doesn't have a counterpart. Adelphoi does have one with Adelphi. Well, exactly. But the problem with Adelphoi, of course, this because Greek is a gendered language. And so if you have Adelphoi, it you could well mean siblings where where there are brothers and sisters That's right. present. And you cannot tell because if you have a room of, you know, 10 siblings and one is a sister and nine are brothers, yes. the word is still going to be masculine, Adele Foy, right? So the King James just used um, brethren here. And so um, what you'll see is they'll um, basically just say, uh, you know, the brethren. And so sometimes it's all masculine. Sometimes, um, like, say, in I think it's Matthew chapter 11 or something like that, where it says, um they said uh is this not the carpenter's son are not his brothers then it names them um are not his brethren with us sorry and then it names the, the six family members and two of them are girls so in that context of brethren it can mean women as well so that's why it would be um tell you know give greetings to the brethren and things like that so it's like uh, to all the people of God, to male and female. So brethren sort of covered everything, but it can also be used as just for brothers as well. So, um, but these guys ha have um, all sorts of different ways they want to change that. So Ishati says, what's Ehrman's take on Easter in Acts? He would probably say it's a, it's a pagan festival. That's what James White says. Most most people in the academy have said that over the years. It's only just recently that a few of them have come out and said, oh, it's not a pagan festival. And I think that's because it looks really dumb to say that nowadays. Um, it's really illiterate. And um, But we, most King James TR people have understood this for many years. And um, some used to sort of teach it, but they've been corrected. But yeah, it seems like the um, people in apol some apologists, the critical text uh, apologists are actually coming full circle and going, oh, it's actually uh, not a pagan festival. So originally the word slave is connected with the Slavic people. Slav because of the many Slavs sold into slavery by the conquering peoples. Okay, very interesting. And so that would be um, the Slavic people. Many times that's to do with, um, you know, people of um, who speak Slavic languages. So the Russians, um, Ukrainians, um, you know, even having the Slavic type of al alphabet, things like that. Uh, so Shaiti said, I'm referring to how Pasha should be translated. He would just say Easter is just a mistranslation and it means Passover. That that's, They all... Pretty much everyone in the academy says that. Even if they say, oh, it's not a pagan festival, they say it should be Passover. So which is um, just a bog standard, that, that's their answer. And usually they go back to, well, Herod wouldn't be talking about this, you know, this sort of thing. And it's like, Luke wrote it. He was a Christian. <laughs> um, he would have been practicing the, the Easter celebration, not uh, killing a lamb every year well why would they go back to the law and practice those things um, they were free from that they would to jesus said do this in remembrance of me jesus they were doing passing the cup around passing the bread around and he said do this in remembrance of me when was he saying that that was the 14th of nissan so that was the the night that uh, of the the passover so and so um in a sense we're not the night they killed the passover Jesus died the day the Passover lambs were killed. So Jesus actually never got to participate in that Passover. He was the Passover lamb that was crucified, uh, that was slain for the sins of the world. And so um, uh, slave has nothing to do with the Slavs. Don't believe propaganda. <laughs> this is a bit of a, um, it's a hot button topic, the whole concept of slaves. And so I'll let um, Helg and Stevie fight that out. So, so everybody understands this. In Greek, the, the noun actually indicates whether it's a masculine noun or a feminine noun. And masculine nouns are usually used for male things but and feminine for female. But also, just every word, 
you know, bookcase has a has a noun, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it might be masculine or feminine. It's got nothing to do with whether the bookcase is male or female. But so so with something like Otto Floyd, when you're dealing with humans, you're saying that sometimes it mean means brothers, and sometimes it just means like brothers and sisters. Exactly. Okay. And and there's really no way to tell if there are, you know, sisters in mind, right? Like there's no way to actually tell. Um, but back in the day when the NRSV was translated, and we wish we had Metzger here to explain this to us, the decision was made to um, to use inclusive language whenever possible and whenever likely, like likely there were women there, so sisters, right? Because often this term brothers would be employed to talk about members of the Jesus movement. Yes. Right. And so we know women were there. This is not a mystery. Right? We yes. know there's lots of women named women um, in the New Testament. So we yes. know there's women there. So they're brothers and sisters. Right. Yeah. Um, and so in the NRSV, when that decision was made to make sure to include sisters, not only to say brothers. Yeah. There was not consistency around around how individual book editors decided to handle that gendered issue, right? So sometimes um, I think believers was a translation that was used sometimes or other words besides um, brothers and sisters. And because um, we one of the goals of the update was to sort of update the, the English in an appropriate way, we didn't mess with the original mandate of the NRSV, but we did decide to translate Adelphoi as brothers and sisters consistently. So if the NRSV oh. had believers for Adelphoi, we translated it as brothers and sisters. So that goes to your consistency point. Yes. And in that case, um, we decided that um, brothers and sisters was more was was a better way of representing the yeah. uh, way that the addressees were being addressed by the writer, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll take a short break and be right back. If you're interested in the Gospels, of the actually be interesting to see what books are on his shelf. Um, actually, doesn't look like a bunch of biblical books there. They look like just sort of anything. But uh, he's probably got a massive bookshelf. The New Testament, the Book of Genesis, the Resurrection. Okay, so he's got his um, little ad here. Um, you can do online courses. So um, I want to do as many videos about Artem as possible because what we want to do is we want to come against his main argumentation. And usually going through these type of videos, this sort of thing comes out, a slip of the tongue or just a little bit of history that gives you an insight into him because he is probably the main player at the moment. Now, he's, uh, at, he's looked up to at the same time as he is despised by the academy so they they hate this guy but they love this guy and so they allow him to be in the academy which is really quite strange um, you would think that someone would have to sign a statement of faith you know, to be able to you know, be a go-to guru but he just got up so high in the academy it's like and i'm not a christian anymore they were like oh okay well and i guess they were all looking at each other going we're not really christians either but um we're pretending to be either because, you know, their wife expects that of them or they, they go to a church or their, their mother would be disappointed with them or they would be off a payroll somewhere or, um, you know, a lot of these guys are fakes and phonies and um, you know, the Bible says to stay away from these type of people. Separate yourself from them. So we want to expose them. It says mark those that cause division and teach things contrary to what you've learned and avoid them. So we're marking them. We're not getting into their teaching and going, wow, that's really nice. And um, like yeah, um, Stephen Boyce said, you know, oh, read Bart Ehrman's material on women caught in adultery. It's like, well, why would why would I want to read his material on that? I may as well be reading a Jehovah's Witness pamphlet. You know, it's to to me just because this guy um, is revered by by James White, by Bart Ehrman, by a lot of evangelicals it doesn't mean he has some sort of supernatural power um direction of jesus the historicity of the exodus or anything else connected with the bible you should check out my online courses where i cover all these topics and more if you'd like to learn about the courses check them out at bartherman.com 
you can receive a discount on any of your purchases simply by entering the code. He is making a mozza of all this. MJ Podcast. Yeah, you know, actually, when I was hired by the NRSV committee, uh, one of my mandates was to work on the inclusive language issue. Uh, oh. And so I uh, so and it was an interesting thing with the NRSV, because when it's when the work started, they didn't mm -hmm. have a mandate about inclusive language. And that hmm. came in only after a while. And it was really interesting to see these. You know, I wasn't one of the translators. I was the research grunt, but I had to kind of go mm -hmm. through and make deal with consistency issues, but especially with inclusive language. It was interesting to see how they evolved over time, because at first, mm -hmm. a lot of the traditionalists thought, you know, you just can't, you know, you you can't do this inclusively and get the word, get the words right. <laughs> you know, you just can't uh -huh. say, you know, and so how do you, you know, they weren't going to say he or she, you know, and they weren't going to, and they weren't going to invent a pronoun. And so how do you, but it was interesting because over time they started realizing there actually are ways to do this that are intelligible and not bad English, you know? And I think, um, you know, what Barbara been saying there, like say Robert True Love, he's got quite a lot of um, information against, you know, gender inclusive, language and talking about even when it says they um and when i read through true love's material i was like mm, sometimes you can be a, you can go a little bit overboard where you know when it talks about the hidden man of the heart when it's talking about a woman it says you know it shouldn't be you know gold and silver and, and adorning yourself with all this sort of stuff but it should be the hidden man of the heart as obviously the hidden woman of the heart is is acceptable you know and so um but yeah, some people are like, no, that's unacceptable. Uh, where I think, um, yeah, things like that. What, but what that does is it, usually it opens the door for these people just to take it right to the nth degree where there's no genders. <laughs> you know what I mean? We know that there's that that's an underlying current constantly um, with even just with um, journalists at the moment that they're, they're worried about just saying things the wrong way or so lose their job or get sued or get called some sort of phobe i kept here in all ages says metzger on the national council's um inclusive language lectionary instead of it being a legitimate version it's the it's a monstrous perversion of the holy scriptures National Council's inclusive language. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so it seems like Metzger was against the type of stuff that um, Nust would be for. So I might actually just type that in. Um, so that's... Churches. Okay. Oh, yeah, it looks like there's a whole bunch of them. So I'll just show you what I'm looking at. I just did a bit of a Google search there. There's Inclusive Language Psalms, National Council of Churches. Um, let's have a look. We'll see if something's actually available to read. I hate it when you can't see it. Okay, other editions. Can we look at that? No. Why tease us with it then? Um, okay, Inclusive uh, Language Dictionary, 1983-1985. so um the dispute flares within the ncc the council is now sponsoring a new edition of the best-selling revised standard version of the bible the rsv translators plan to make uh, use of the inclusive language such as humanity instead of man um, but they will have nothing to do with the approach of gold's panel 
uh, says Reverend Bruce Metzger, the New Testament pr professor at Princeton uh, Theological Seminary, Seminary and the head of the RSV committee. Uh, the changes introduced in language relating to the deity are tantamount to rewriting the Bible. As a Christian, as a scholar, I find this altogether unacceptable and will divide it will divide the church rather than work for ecumenical understanding. <laughs> so it's like he's saying it's going to divide the church where he wants to bring unity by ecumenical understanding. So with the uh, he was pushing for unity with the Orthodox Church, with the Catholics and all the rest of it, but he's saying that that talking about these gender things um, cause these problems. So, yeah, that would be an interesting um, thing to look at, uh, especially since we've got Jennifer Nust. So what I might do is um, during the week, I might uh, read through some of this material, um, go on a few, um, go down a few rabbit holes and just check this out because it looks like it's been a controversy for quite a while. Um, Helg says... I would rather see Omen's Greek and biblical bookshelf than his biblical uh, courses. Yeah. Uh, Stevie says, Adelphi is not feminine, so why include sisters in translation? Um, I think because the context warrants it. Now, sometimes I was talking to the entire church, which would include women, um, like I might bring up the example of what I've got in on my website, tr.org.au. Um, so if I go down to Matthew, say chapter 1, verse 2, so we've got the concept of brethren here. So, and his brethren, the, the King James Version um, brethren um, is changed to brothers in the New King James Version. But brethren means both brothers and sisters when the context warrants it. For example, Matthew 12, uh, then one said to them, thy mother and thy brethren, okay, uh, stand without desiring to speak to thee. But he answered and said, and said unto them who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? Again. And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother, my sister, and my mother. So that's where um, people say, Okay, brethren. So I should really uh, just check. So we've got Adelphos here. So let's go to um, Matthew 12, 47. So I'll just jump up here. 12, we'll just check out what the Greek has here. Yeah, so um, brethren, that's a translation of Adelphoi there. So yeah, hopefully that helps a little bit with that. That's um, one of the reasons why, because Jesus included his sisters in the concept of brethren. So there's that's where the definition um, is warranted because of the context. Okay, so I'll just move that aside. And I'm only gonna go for a little bit longer. So uh, I've been three hours already. And I've got a few things to do today, so I will uh, just continue for a little bit longer and try to break it off at a good um, break-off point. You know, and so they exactly. so they got better and better. Metzger in particular got really pretty good at it. But it did mean that there were these these places where, you know, it, I think they just decided that they weren't they were going to they're going to make it inclusive when it was referring to humans when it was inclusive when there were men and women both involved. But they weren't going to be wooden in how they did it. Uh, uh huh. You know, uh -huh. Some places might be. They thought, yeah, the believers thing doesn't doesn't work too well. But, but they, yeah. yeah, they didn't make some good decisions. But okay, so that's interesting. So so everywhere. So is their their idea was that like if Paul's writing a letter to Thessalonica or something, and he says Adelphoi, that mm -hmm. uh, 
he doesn't he's not just talking to the men and so they'll exactly. translate it brothers and sisters but there were right. other places like uh we're in the book of acts where somebody would be talking to a group of men <laughs> that they yeah, yeah like men brothers and that's a like traditional greek address and brothers, right yeah. Yeah, and, yeah and so did you all change that as well to you know them? i can't remember i didn't check before this conversation yeah, yeah, um yeah, i can't yeah. remember what we ended up deciding to do we talked about it um we talked about how that's a formal greek address in cases like that we might have put in notes i don't remember i'd have yeah, to go look right. at individual cases yeah so, you, I mean, translations often do have notes. Do you, are you a big fan of uh, translation notes? And do you think like there should be, because my, my experience is that most students at least don't look at them. <laughs> yeah. So do you have a view about I mean, notes? for this purpose, I think, yes. I think it was important to put them in because we're trying to be as transparent as possible about what the decisions were and why they were that and that there were other alternatives. And I'm I'm happy that we did that. I think that was the right thing. I can I can see the wisdom of, of having a translation that's bare of notes. But in this case, I think given the um, aspiration of the NRSV and the NRSV update, and I think the RSV as well back in the day to speak to an academic as well as confessional audience, it makes sense to have that information available yeah, yeah, so agree. that people who are studying the, only the English can see yeah. the work, see the work. Yeah. 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 You know, the other thing I'll say is that with the NRSV, they really did take votes on every issue. Uh, I was a secretary for a few years before I was hired. But and I was like I sat in the room with was dealing with the uh, the Old Testament and they uh, they'd have six people in the room and they always wanted to have seven or five because if they actually vote and it's like would win by one. OK, we'll do it that way. And uh -huh, uh, interesting. Yeah, the whole every word basically their vote. Oh, they discuss it and then they take a vote. It's like, oh my god, it's three to two. Okay, that's what it is then. <laughs> so interesting. Yeah, we didn't do that. I mean, I guess I did feel like we did have votes in the sense that, you know, uh -huh. we had the opportunity to state our opinion and if we could persuade yeah. the group, then we won, you know, but wow. we didn't okay. take formal votes. Ah, well, you had a much more amenable committee than they did for the, uh, the original NRC. <laughs> you, you all are very agreeable. So you mentioned something a minute ago, and you mentioned several times about people, you know, who just read the English. And yeah. the, the New Testament um, is, of course, written in, in Greek. And so can you just say something about like how how when you're when you're doing a translation, whether not just the NRSV updated edition, but just kind of generally when somebody's translating the New Testament, it, a lot of people, I think most people will know uh, who are listening to this, that that we don't have the original uh, New Testament. We don't right. when when whoever wrote the Gospel of John wrote the Gospel of John. We don't have that thing that he wrote. <laughs> we have like yes, cop yes. copies from many later years later, and yeah. these copies are all different from each other. So yes. I mean, do, how do how do translators decide which? So if you got you know if you got seven hundred copies of this particular book and they're like differences all over the place, which which manuscript do you translate? Well, um, in the I mean, the RSV and the NRSV. Um, and the, you know, come out of a tradition of using um, European and North American textual criticism and the insights of textual criticism in order to um, make decisions about what the underlying text should be. So Can the underlying textual criticism, because I think yes. some people will think that means like interpreting text. <laughs> so, right. Well, you, you know, you're free to help me do this, but um, <laughs> so textual don't, don't let her say that you all audience, because she's an expert in this. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think how to say it. I mean, you're better at this kind of, you know, explaining. But so the idea is you have, you know, thousands of manuscripts of the Greek New Testament and you have to make a decision about, well, what text will we print as the um, guiding text? Right. I'm going to use that word. So we people have decided differently about what that that guiding text, that text that's printed in. In if you open up a, um, an edition, what the main text is. The You're text talking about the Greek, the, the, uh, the Greek. edition of the Greek New Testament. The edition yeah. of the Greek New Testament. And what textual critics do is is debate the method and the rules for how to develop that text that ought to be printed as the text that from which we would might we might do our translation. Yeah. Um, and then uh, textual critics, usually like the English translators, try to show their work through something called a critical apparatus that shows what they didn't decide to put in the main text. Okay. So um, the RSV and the NRSV, and, I, and also the NIV, although that's a different, little bit different story, um, follow the tradition of employing New Testament textual criticism, that art of or science of putting, you know, deciding what the text is and then showing your work. Hmm. 
the art and that's what I call it. It's just an art. Um, as the base text for the translations that are made. And so one of the reasons why the Revised Standard Version was made is because there had been so many advances in the ways in which um, scholars who do work with the manuscripts understood what the text should be. And similarly with the new Revised Standard Version, Bruce Metzger, as you know, was himself a very important, famous text critic. And um, there had been advances in, or changes maybe would be a better way of saying it, uh, New Testament textual critics might want to say advances, but progress or something, but um, there are changes in understanding of what the best text ought to be. Um, so in Metzger's generation of New Testament textual critics, the goal was to find the original text, the text as the author of individual New Testament books had written it down, and to try to figure that out based on comparing yeah, um, various manuscripts and using criteria and methods to understand what the original text was. Mm -hmm. And nowadays people talk about something called the initial text. What was the text, the Greek text that from which all the other manuscript evidence can be explained. It's incredibly complicated. Yeah. There's a, you know, it's, you know, we could take an entire podcast and we still wouldn't understand what the heck they're talking about. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so, all right, but when, yeah. you, when, you, when your committee or any committee, so we don't, mm -hmm. but just when a committee, well, I might, I might just leave it there. So she's just explained pretty much what Jeff Riddle was trying to explain to Elijah Hickson and Peter Gurry. Um, but they were saying, no, 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 it's not the case. And then um, he just kept bringing up like quotations from people in the academy saying this is the case. Um, and now it's just sort of admitted slowly. It's like, oh, yeah, well, some people were going this way and some people were going that way. It's like, just as Jeff Riddle said, you know. Um, Helg says, uh, Ehrman's old New Testament courses are actually informative and interesting from University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and they're still available online, I think. Yeah, and so I've listened to most of Bart Ehrman's material um, from his misquoting Jesus onwards. And um, when I got to um, God's Problem, I listened through that. And it was just so depressing. It was just like he, he just he has a theology without the devil in it the devil's just non-existent <laughs> it's like no the devil brought all these problems it's not god you know and so he just you know kept, kept going on about you know oh, god's made all these problems and god's done this and god's done that it's like yeah if you actually believe the bible mate you would have a way different perspective but uh obviously he rejects the bible so what we're looking at is two people here who are pretty much on par with their agnosticism atheism uh, and doubt of the Bible, because because usually when Bardem is talking to someone, we assume the other person on the other end is like a Christian or a, or a half baked Christian. You know, they're sort of tr fudging their way through. Jennifer Nust is actually probably even worse than Bardem in a lot of ways, and so um, these two are like um, th these two are really bad. And so to have these people have an interview between themselves um, is, you know, it's quite enlightening to listen to what they got to say. Now, a lot of what they say would just be just general bog standard things that apply, you know, to anything. You know, if you're talking about linguistics or languages and you're talking about uh, translational methodology, of course, it's you know, some of what they say is going to be true. But a lot of it is twisted and a lot of it's lies, uh, a lot of it's um, things that they've learned from uh, people like Metzger and Aylens and Carlo Martini and others. And so Eugene Nider and other uh, heretics. So anyway, we've gone just over halfway. And so this means it's probably just going to be a two-part series unless they drop a whole heap of clangers in the, the next one. Because sometimes I can go for like five minutes and we, you know, we go for three hours just on that. But um we'll continue this on later on i'm not really sure when i'll get time to do this um but um yeah thanks for joining us guys i appreciate your input and all your comments and i'm going to end it there god bless you guys and have a great weekend